Imagine you were happily cruising along in space in your very own mining ship when suddenly you pick up a faint distress signal from far away. Checking your spaceship's digital atlas, you discover that the signal is coming from a colony on a planet called LV-426. Hmm, where have you heard that name before? Landing on this distant moon, you exit your spaceship, hoping to rescue some desperate colonists, only to come face to face with the galaxy's most formidable predator. Hello and welcome to another special episode of the Infographic Show. Today we're putting you up against the most perfect organism in the universe. Could you defeat it? You versus a xenomorph. Xenomorphs or aliens are a parasitic species whose real origins are unclear. Some believe that xenos were genetically engineered by an ancient spacefaring civilization known as the Engineers or Malakak. The Malakak may have used xenomorphs to terraform planets by wiping out all large species and then starting fresh with their own genetically engineered creations. Or they may simply have been a biological weapon meant to disinfect experiments they think went wrong, or to use against their enemies. Others, however, believe that the xenomorphs evolved in a dark, distant corner of the galaxy and were discovered by the engineers and other spacefaring civilizations. Though their origins remain a mystery, we have enough experience with xenomorphs to have learned a lot about them as a species. The xenomorph life cycle begins with an egg, which contains a short-lived organism known as a facehugger. Upon detecting the pheromones of an approaching host, the egg will awaken the facehugger within, which immediately attacks the would-be host and attempts to latch onto an an orifice so it can deposit a parasitic larvae inside the host. Typically, a host's mouth is the preferred larva-laying route into a host, but given their adaptability to different hosts across the galaxy, any orifice or even a sufficiently large wound will do. Once inside, the larvae feed off of vital fluids, making the host incredibly hungry and forcing it to eat more, which in turn further feeds the larvae. Once sufficiently large, the larvae will then exit the host as a chest burster, so named for their proclivity to burst directly through a host's chest. Once free, the larvae seeks shelter somewhere dark and isolated, where by some unknown biological process it is able to quickly mature into an adult drone at an extraordinary rate. Xenomorphs are a eusocial species, much like ants, honeybees, and other social insects, with a clearly defined caste system. It's thought that all members of a xeno hive are females, and at the very top of the hive is the only fertile female, the queen. She is solely responsible for egg laying and every other member of the brood is her offspring. Drones or warriors are the workhorse forces of the hive and are responsible for defending the hive as well as finding prey and new hosts for the eggs. A third cast, Praetorians, are only produced when a hive has grown large enough to support them. These are the most formidable of xenomorphs, with the exception of the queen herself, and act as bodyguards to the queen. However, as they mature, Praetorians exude a scent that is different than the rest of the hive, which prompts the hive's drones to attack it and chase it away from the hive. Once fully mature, the Praetorian will return and be attacked once again, and either be killed off by the hive or grudgingly accepted by the queen after suffering too many casualties amongst her drones. Interestingly, despite the hostility, Praetorians will defend the queen to the death. It was originally thought that they were the only males, and perhaps this process of being chased away and forced to fight their way back proved that they were the fittest and thus could fertilize a queen and produce a stronger hive. But after a Praetorian was observed molting into a queen after the loss of the hive's current queen, this theory has largely been discarded. Since then, it's generally accepted that much like like many insects and invertebrates, here on Earth, queens are completely self-fertilizing and don't require a male partner. Taking on an entire hive of angry xenomorphs is guaranteed death. But let's say that you were pitted up against just one of these vicious creatures. How could you defeat it? And what are you up against exactly? The hive of a xenomorph is made out of a chitin that is believed to be coated with a layer of polarized silicon, which makes it very resistant to electricity and heat. This layer of chitin covers almost the entire body, with the exception of the joints and the underside of the neck and is also extremely resistant to small arms fire. At anything but point-blank range, any caliber smaller than a 5.56 mm round will simply bounce off. While resistant to heat, xenomorphs show a vulnerability to weapons such as flamethrowers and will generally shy away from open sources of flame. Extreme cold such as liquid nitrogen is also exceptionally effective against a xenomorph, and it's thought that rapid changes in temperature cause the xenomorph's chitinous armor to rapidly contract and expand, causing it great pain. A xenomorph is also able to match the outer layers of its body with the ambient temperature, making it invisible to being tracked by thermal imagers. This seems to suggest that xenomorphs evolved as predators on a cold world with little or no daylight, as this ability would have kept them hidden from heat-sensing prey. The lack of eye organs also seems to indicate that this is a strong possibility, and it's thought that xenomorphs track their prey by scent and electroreception, much like a hammerhead shark and many stingrays. A xenomorph's acidic blood poses a significant risk to any would 
be attackers, as it's extremely corrosive and capable of easily dissolving steel, aluminum, or even titanium. Its ability to also disintegrate normally acid-resistant plastics indicate that the blood may not be an actual acid, but rather a fluid that works to break molecular bonds in an unknown way. So how do you kill something that can shrug off bullets and will bleed acid blood on you even if you manage to wound it? Fire is the most obvious and immediate answer, and for that there's no better tool than a high-powered flamethrower. Though most nations have discontinued their use of flamethrowers due to being ineffective in modern combat, and for the very bad press they tend to create, Russia, who traditionally doesn't much care what the rest of the world thinks, has recently re-evaluated their use. A 2016 US Army report notes that Russia has found the weapons useful for urban and mountain warfare, despite being illegal by international law to use in civilian population centers. Bunker bus and clearing light infantry. Russia's re-adoption of the flamethrower has actually seen them add four dedicated regiments for flamethrower units in 2014, so it's time to make like a Russian fire bat and get your hands on some sweet xenomorph-destroying flamethrowers. But it's not as easy as all that, since xenomorphs have shown an incredible ability to adapt and problem-solve through creative means. Sure, you might get a few blasts off with Comrade Flamethrower, but with a maximum range of 60 feet, a xenomorph will simply retreat and rethink its plan of attack. Given their incredible stealth and their ability to squeeze into very tight places, a Xeno will likely simply back off and wait to literally get the drop on you. Plus, flamethrowers have one weakness that quickly becomes obvious to most of the world's militaries. The backpacks of pressurized and highly combustive gas make for really, really good explosive targets. Remember a Xenomorph's acidic blood? Well, some of them can spit it from their mouths at incredible ranges, and with its ability to dissolve most known materials, those tanks on your back aren't going to survive for long. While they won't won't explode as the fuel still requires heat to ignite, you're going to be left with, in essence, an empty squirt gun when a xenomorph comes to eat your face off. You might be tempted to fall back on firearms. After all, despite their bullet-resistant hides, large calibers have been proven to injure a xenomorph. But firearms require you to see your target and to be accurate enough to actually hit one once you do see it. And with the xenomorph's ability to hide in the smallest nooks and crannies and its incredible speed and agility, you're taking your chances going with a firearm. We here at the Infographic show have our favorites amongst the great engineers, philosophers, and scientists, but when it comes time to take on a genetically perfect super predator from across the galaxy, there's really only one name that comes to mind, Alfred Nobel, the father of modern explosives. Inventing TNT in 1867, Nobel gave the man the tools to literally move Earth and set humanity down the path of bigger and better explosions. That path would eventually lead to the holiest of battlefield holies, the Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher. A tripod mounted weapon, the Mark 19 fires 40mm grenades at a rate of up to 375 rounds per minute and is used extensively by US Armed Forces for their anti-personnel and anti-vehicle operations. With a maximum distance of 2,212 meters and an effective point target range of 1,500 meters, there is nowhere to hide from the rain of explosive death it unleashes. On impact, a 40mm grenade has a 100% kill ratio for up to 5 meters, with a 50% kill ratio at 10 meters, making it an un paralleled xenomorph killing tool. With its high rate of fire, if the first one doesn't do the job, the next three or four definitely will. We don't usually think about aliens when we think about dinosaurs, but someone by the name of Dr. Matt Kaplan recently asked a very fascinating question about these two subjects. In his search for an answer, he was forced to delve into topics such as light speed, black holes, and telescopes. Join him in his exploration in this episode of the Infographic Show, Could Aliens 65 Million Light Years Away From Earth See Dinosaurs Alive? Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell button so that you can be part of our notification squad. In theory, the answer is yes. Light that left Earth 65 million years ago is now 65 million light years away. So if aliens knew where to point their telescope, they could see dinosaurs. But is it possible for anyone, even a super technologically advanced alien, to build a telescope powerful enough? Light takes time to travel, so looking at anything is equivalent to looking back in time. And the farther away it is, the farther back in time you see. For example, if your eyes are about two feet away from the screen you're watching this video on, then you're seeing this video as it was about two nanoseconds earlier. That's basically instantaneous, and way faster than the human reaction time, so the light speed delay doesn't muck up our daily lives. But if you look at the moon, the light left it about a second ago, long enough for there to be noticeable pauses in communication with Apollo astronauts. For the sun, it's closer to 8 minutes, so if for some crazy reason the sun disappeared, then no one on Earth would know it for about 8 minutes. 
When astronomers look through their telescopes at distant stars, they're seeing them as they were many years ago. Coincidentally, this is one way astronomers measure distance. A light year is just the distance it takes light to travel in a year, conveniently tying distance and age into one number. So again, in theory, the light that left the Earth millions of years ago is now millions of light years away, and in that light is a glimpse of dinosaurs. Since the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, then the closest alien that could see dinosaurs, if he knew where to point his telescope, is 65 million light years away. But in practice, it's much harder, because the Earth is small and 65 million light years is a long distance. For perspective, the vast majority of the visible stars in the night sky are within about 1,000 light years of us. The Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across. The nearest galaxy, Andromeda, is about 2.5 million light years away. At 65 million light years, our alien astronomers would be in the far off Virgo cluster of galaxies. So. If these aliens want to see dinosaurs, they're going to need a big telescope. Human astronomers can only barely resolve nearby planets in our own galaxy, let alone extragalactic planets. In fact, only a handful of observations have been reported of extragalactic exoplanets. One is the Andromeda, and the other is cheating. It's only 2,000 light years away from Earth because it was acquired by the Milky Way in a galactic merger. So how do telescopes allow us, or aliens, to see across the universe? Consider an analogy. Imagine the sun is constantly casting an enormous barrage of little tiny bouncy balls in all directions. These balls are photons, or individual particles of light. On Earth, some will bounce off of a T-Rex and then get caught in your eye, so your brain will be able to register, oh, that's a T-Rex, I'm going to die. The farther you are from the T-Rex, the fewer balls make it to your eye, and so the harder it is to see the T-Rex. Some other balls will hit the T-Rex and bounce up and off into space to travel the universe. Telescopes are lenses and mirrors to refocus a bunch of those space balls over a wide area to a small collector so that we can get the benefit of a really big eye, and the farther you want to see, the bigger an eye you need. So how big does an alien telescope need to be? Fundamentally, a given lens can only focus light so well due to quantum properties of light. No matter how super intelligent these aliens are, they can't cheat fundamental physics. Using what we know about the resolution limits of man-made lenses, physicists can calculate that a lens would need to be over 36 million miles across, which is about a third of the distance to the sun. This lens would fill up about half of Mercury's orbit, and it would only give the aliens a view of the Earth as one pixel. And if that wasn't impossibly huge enough already, these aliens wanted to see dinosaurs, not just the Earth. If you want to resolve a dinosaur, even as just a dot, then the telescope lens needs to be much bigger, 4.4 light years across. Such a telescope would fit comfortably between our sun and the nearest star system, Alpha Centauri. Human astronomers often give their telescopes hilarious names like the Very Large Array and the Overwhelmingly Large Telescope, but somehow these just feel inadequate. We don't have to sit around and debate whether or not an alien can build a telescope this big. Einstein's theory of relativity actually gives us the answer. General relativity tells us that matter curves spacetime, and the more mass you have, the more it curves space. If you put enough mass in one spot, the spacetime curvature will be so extreme that it must collapse on itself, forming a black hole. In fact, a ball of glass 28 light minutes across will have enough concentrated mass to collapse into a black hole. So yes, in theory, the view of a dinosaur is out there in space, but sadly, no aliens will ever get a glimpse of them. Pre-invasion. If they wanted us all dead, they would have just dropped rocks on our heads. The fact that they didn't meant they wanted this world and us alive. We saw them coming a few months before arrival. Astronomers spotted the telltale dimming of starlight as their massive ships crossed between the stars and the Earth. We got our first high-resolution images of what was coming a few days later and the alarm bells immediately began to go off. 26 massive ships, though of course all we could initially see from our vantage point were the gargantuan meteoroid shields. In a way, this was good news. These aliens couldn't possibly be that far ahead of us technologically if they were using meteoroid shields to protect their spacecraft while traveling at a few percentage points of the speed of light. But the fact that there were so many of them could only mean one thing. These creatures, whoever they were, weren't coming to visit. They were planning on staying, one way or another. When they ignored our attempts at communication across nearly the entire range of the EM spectrum, we were pretty sure they weren't friendly. The United States and its NATO allies made preparations shifting to a wartime economy and instituting drafts. Nearly the entirety of the US military was recalled home for the first time since before World War II. If the United States survived, then and only then would it come to rescue its friends. For now, Europe and Asia were on their own. When they were a month out, they flipped their spacecraft around and fired massive engines to begin to slow down from a whopping 10% the speed of light. We got a few photos of them before the massive fiery plumes blinded our cameras. Long, skinny ships hiding behind a massive meteoroid shield 
and fully surrounding the central core of each ship was what looked like detachable bubbles. Landing craft. Day 1. Technically, we fired first. Like many other Iraq-Afghanistan vets, I got the recall notice before they started drafting 18-year-olds fresh out of high school. I found myself back in the 1st Infantry Division, the fighting first. At 0942 hours Zulu, we first made contact with the enemy. Fiery streaks lit up the night skies, their landing craft penetrated the atmosphere. At first, there were only one or two, then dozens, then hundreds. It had been impossible to predict where the aliens would attempt to land, but radar allowed us to track their ship formations in high orbit and figure out to within a few hundred miles where each formation would likely land. Then US forces dispersed across the most likely landing zones that could realistically be defended, with plans for each rapid response force to immediately move to engage the nearest landing site. We got lucky. They landed right on top of us. Patriot and NASAM batteries were the first to meet the enemy, unleashing high-altitude interceptors. Designed to take out incoming ballistic missiles, these were our best weapons for hitting the aliens while they were still making re-entry, and their sensors would be blinded by fiery plasma outside their ship. I watched dozens of our missiles scream up into the sky and hit. We all let out a cheer. I hadn't even realized I'd been holding my breath. I guess I expected a force field or some other sci-fi crap, but sure enough, multiple of the large reddish lights turned into many smaller lights from Patriot Impacts. This was their most vulnerable moment, but we couldn't afford to expend all of our Patriot missiles. We'd need them for air defense against the enemy's aircraft. Next, the Air Force had its turn. We had a little over 100 combat aircraft assigned to our rapid response force, and most were a mix of F-16s, F-15s, and F-35s. The F-15s and 16s engaged the descending transport ships with AIM-120s, a smaller missile than the Patriots Pack 2. This meant not every hit was a kill, but at the incredible speed the descending landing craft were moving, even minor structural damage proved lethal. Dozens more tumbled out of the sky, ripping themselves apart at hypersonic speed. But there were hundreds coming down on top of our heads. There was nothing we could do but prepare our armor and our IFVs for immediate thrust against the enemy the moment they touched down. We wouldn't give them time to unbuckle their seatbelts and stretch their legs. The landing craft fired their retro rockets to slow down while still high up in the sky, making them easy targets for our attached mobile air defenses like Avengers. The smaller Stinger missiles of the Avengers had less punch than the Air Force's AIM-120s, but were zeroed in on the thermal plume of the landing craft's retro rockets. Taking out just one of those engines meant the entire craft would fly out of control, dooming its occupants to a very unpleasant end several thousand feet below. Soon, they were low enough for heavy machine guns to reach out, but they had very little effect on the aliens' landing craft. Things were going entirely too good. And then, just like that, they weren't. From an estimated 344 landing craft, each the size of a small grocery store, we knocked out about 70. The aliens had flown straight into the teeth of the best air defenses in the world, and we'd only knocked out 20% of their forces. Then, it was their turn. As the landing craft flew over us to hit their LZ, they unleashed a volley of something from their bellies. There was the sound of roaring engines and then an electric hum, and hundreds of darts, each about the length of a human arm, flew out in all directions below them. I watched one drive straight through the armor of a Bradley fighting vehicle, and when I thought the worst was over, the entire vehicle suddenly started burning intensely from within. Another one of those spikes embedded itself halfway in the front armor of an Abrams, and then it let off a blinding flash. Several feet of the tough front armor plating slagged instantly, and the driver must have been turned to ash. Over a hundred Hummers, Bradley, Strikers, and Abrams slagged from the rain of strange glowing darts before the landing craft finally touched down. And that was when the war truly began. The craft nearest to our location popped several hatches open all along its exterior and began disgorging troops. One of our Abrams put a round straight into an open hatch. It must have killed a dozen or more of the aliens. Turrets ringing the oval-shaped landing craft began to fire back, unleashing a volley of bright white projectiles that landed on the armor of our vehicles with a distinct metallic sound, but penetrated far deeper than any form of heavy machine gun should. Lucky for us, the turrets weren't particularly accurate at the ranges we were engaging, with the Abrams staying put at just under 3,000 meters, or right under the maximum range of its 120mm smoothbore cannon. Our Bradleys lent their Hellfire missiles to the attack, but the landing craft were so large that these were proving ineffective. We got ordered to save our missiles, as the Abrams did their best to snipe the turrets, laying out an inaccurate but still deadly flow of fire. I wish I could remember more, but just then, one of the glowing rods from an overhead landing craft struck just outside my vehicle. Days 2 to 8. I awoke in a field hospital nearly 72 hours later. 
The blast had ripped open the side of the Bradley but miraculously spared most of the crew. Someone had grabbed me and dragged me to safety. I was grateful but I felt awful. I had basically slept through the first day of the fight for Earth. When I woke, I found out the aliens had landed in a tight formation roughly resembling a 20 mile diameter circle. The first landing craft were carrying infantry, and they fared poorly against our mechanized forces, but the rapid fire turrets on their massive landing craft made the assault deadly, until they were knocked out one by one by extremely accurate cannon or missile fire. Trying to blow up the ships themselves was fruitless, they were too big and stubbornly resistant to explosions. Whatever their tactical shortcomings, the aliens built their equipment tough. These turrets bought time for the armor to unload from the massive landing craft inside the makeshift perimeter, and then the greatest tank battle since Desert Storm raged across the face of the United States. I gathered a few things about the aliens from the recently wounded. First, we were calling them elves from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. They vaguely resembled traditional fantasy elves with tall, spindly bodies and small faces with huge eyes that wrapped around their heads slightly. They stood about a foot or more taller than humans, but we probably weighed the same on average. Second, their tech was tough and more advanced than ours, but not by an extreme amount. In fact, it seemed their spacefaring capabilities were more advanced than their weapons, which might have been no more than a hundred years ahead of ours. For comparison, a modern Abrams tank would wreck any armored vehicle on a World War I battlefield but was still vulnerable to World War I artillery. Thankfully, our tanks could still put a hurt on their vehicles and take one or two hits as long as they weren't at close range. I suppose that makes sense, you can only push material technology so far and have it remain cost effective. Aliens were still subject to budgets, especially if they were equipping a planet-sized invasion force. I demanded to be sent back to the front but was kept in for treatment for another few days. In that time, I noticed there were much less wounded than expected coming into the field hospital. I asked the doctor about it hoping it meant we were winning. She just shrugged her shoulders and said not many were surviving the alien weapons long enough to be considered wounded. Days 9 through 13. We were in retreat. The aliens had broken through our lines and were pushing deep into behind our lines. I couldn't remember the last time the US Army had ordered a general retreat on this scale. As soldiers and medical staff rushed to transport what supplies and equipment could be rescued, an intelligence officer grabbed me and pulled me aside along with five others. He knew my name, which surprised me. Then I realized he'd read my service record. He knew I was a veteran who'd already seen combat not just against aliens but in the hills and streets of Iraq and Afghanistan. Looking around at the other five, I could tell they were old enough to have seen combat too. He had a special mission, and we were going to assist him in its execution. We were going to go to the ground, let the army retreat and the enemy push past us. Then we were going to come out of hiding and nab one of them alive drag it back to friendly lines and turn it into intelligence geeks for study and interrogation. My eyes practically fell out of my head. Nab a live alien behind enemy lines. Wasn't this the stuff special operation forces were for? Major Hubrak shook his head. Not this time. They were all already busy or dead. Mostly dead. Days 14 to 18. While the army retreated, we hid. It wasn't particularly hard. The aliens didn't seem to be looking very thoroughly for partisans or saboteurs. We made camp under some thermal-proof tents in the middle of a thicket and just waited. There were six of us. Major Hubrak was with Army Intelligence, though some unit I'd never heard of. That told me he was about as black world as they came, and it didn't surprise me that he had the authority to wrangle five combat veterans for his very special operation behind enemy lines. Then again, he'd never shown me any orders. For all I knew, he was a madman playing at his own private war against the armies invading Earth. But he didn't seem like one. He was smart, lethally smart, the type you don't want plotting against you. He was the first to start pointing out the obvious about the aliens. This is their first war against a combined arms enemy, he muttered one night as we ate our MREs in the dark. I was curious, so I asked him to explain himself. Think about it. Before they landed, they didn't perform any form of electromagnetic suppression. No precision strikes against command and control nodes, supply depots, nothing. No seed missions. They don't even have any real air power, just those landing craft in their turrets. Everyone stopped eating simultaneously. They never fought against a modern combined arms enemy before. In fact, they remind me of the Russians, big on the ground tanks, lots of infantry, artillery. They got lots of all three, but they don't work well together. Oh, and I suppose the Russians at least have combat aviation. The elves don't. I could see that Major Hubrak had been dissecting the aliens in his mind without ever getting his hands on one. I was afraid of what he'd do once he did. We're their first invasion, or the first modern invasion anyway. They probably wiped out a few industrial revolution or pre-industrial revolution worlds, hence why they knew to build tanks and use artillery. 
but they don't use them well together, not like we do. I don't think they've ever met stiff resistance, even amongst themselves. In fact, they fight so badly I think they were unified a long time ago or maybe had an evolutionary predisposition to be united as a species. Of all the rocks they chose to land on, they hit this one. Poor sons of bitches. The Major shook his head, genuinely sad for a moment that the aliens decided to invade the one world that had been at war with itself for its entire history. I had to admit a lot of what the Major said was ringing true. Well then, if they're so bad at fighting, why are we the ones retreating? I challenged him though, because at the end of the day, it wasn't the aliens packing up and going home. Their technology's better. Tanks and artillery's hit harder. Hell, even their rifles do. You can ditch the body armor, by the way, it won't help any. The Major's words hung in the air between the six of us for a while. Nobody said much after that. All of us left with the same thought. Sure, we were better at fighting, but was that enough to overcome their tech advantage? Days 19 through 24. The Air Force had been making life hell for the elves all week. Every day we heard the telltale roar of jet engines launching strikes deep behind the front lines. The Major was right, the aliens didn't have much air power and seemed completely surprised at our heavy use of it. He supposed that the aliens might have come from a world with gravity so high that atmospheric flight was impractical, so it was never widely adopted. But then you should expect the elves to be shorter, stockier, so as to better operate in heavy gravity. Maybe their atmosphere was thinner, making it harder to fly. Yet it seemed like the elves had no problem breathing our atmosphere unless they were equipped with some sort of internal breathing apparatus. We observed them from a distance as they disembarked from their landing craft and moved equipment and supplies to the front lines. Most stood at least a foot taller than a human with pinkish skin and those weird wraparound almond-shaped eyes that reminded me of the popular gray aliens people claim abducted them. They talked in a weird high-pitched sing-song language. And when they got excited or scared, like when a loitering F-15 dropped a cluster munition on an entire column of infantry, they let off a series of melodic hoots. Sort of reminded me of a wind chime. If the aliens had come to Earth without understanding air combat, they were quick learners. They dismantled turrets from some of the landing craft and equipped them on mobile platforms to provide air cover. This didn't do much for very high-flying aircraft, but it kept our Apaches and A-10s at bay. It was anti-air artillery, but on steroids, blasting out what must have been a hundred rounds a second that shredded any aircraft that strayed too close. But they were still vulnerable to high-altitude air attack, and the US Air Force was giving them absolute hell for it. We watched from our hiding place, the Major taking notes down and making observations, things he would be able to report to superiors from behind enemy lines to help them paint a better intelligence picture of how these aliens operated, strengths, weaknesses, the basic work of military intelligence. Another thing the aliens apparently had never encountered a need for. Our primary mission wasn't forgotten though, we needed to capture a live one. The Major wanted to wait for the front to move back from our position so the enemy would thin out, then ambush a patrol in the rear area. Days 25 to 28. There was somebody else out here. Another team lurking behind enemy lines. Only these guys must have been special ops because they were making life hell for the aliens. The first clue was when we were watching a column of alien vehicles move down a road toward the front. Lead vehicle hit an anti-vehicle mine that wasn't there the day before. I know I'd watched the alien trucks go down that same road before. Their vehicles were tough, but 35 pounds of shaped charge explosive under the chassis will ruin pretty much any armored vehicle's day. With the lead vehicle knocked out, a second explosion thundered at the rear column, a planted charge, likely C4, detonated remotely. The rearmost vehicle was now also effectively destroyed. That left the column stuck. Dashing off the road wasn't an option, the terrain was too muddy for it. In the same breath, four Javelin anti-tank guided missiles screamed out from opposite sides of the column, smashing into four separate vehicles. Alien tanks and IFVs had armor tougher than ours, but were as lightly armored on the top as ours were and the javelins easily penetrated, incinerating the crew inside. Panicked elves started dismounting from their vehicles or turning blindly into swampy woods and firing. Machine guns started strafing the panicked alien infantry. There were few who survived long enough to get to safety. Then, just as fast as the ambush started, it ended, with the unknown attacker slipping away into the woods. Good thing, too, because the elf tanks came with two rounds, one for armored vehicles and one for general area destruction. Once they got going with that second type of round, very few trees were left standing. I counted four tanks and at least 32 KIA elves, no sign of any dead Americans. If we kept this pace up, we might just win this thing. We needed to be somewhere the aliens had dropped their guard, and that meant moving deeper into enemy-held territory, so we packed up our gear and used the cover of night to move out. Days 29 to 33. 
We set up camp outside a small town, the type with very few streetlights and no building higher than three stories tall. There was no telling where the front lines were now. The Major had a satellite radio, but he said it was only for extreme emergencies. If the elves had finally learned to sniff out electromagnetic signals, a transmission could lead them straight to us. I marveled that we still had satellites at all. But the Major assured me that even if the elves had thought of taking them out, it wasn't easy finding hundreds of satellites drifting in very high orbits over Earth. Plus, the Space Force had no doubt supplemented our existing satellites with swarms of CubeSats by now. Even an advanced alien species would have a hard time finding a floating shoebox unless it was actively broadcasting. Our new location allowed us to recon what life was like for civilians caught behind enemy lines. I wish we hadn't. Days 34 to 38. I expected armed patrols. Maybe some sort of alien civilian administration center, a slave camp, I don't know. What I didn't expect was nothing. No sign of the aliens at all. What we did find though was more disturbing. We made contact with an elderly couple living at the edge of town, who about jumped out of their skin as six heavily armed and camouflaged men suddenly melted out of the tree line at dusk. They were overjoyed to see us though, but disappointed to find out it was just us. There was no liberation force. Then they filled us in on what had been happening behind enemy lines. The aliens were yet to establish real communications, but had managed to get their point across by a lot of gesturing and a fair amount of force. They rounded up the population going from house to house. Anyone that resisted was killed, along with their entire family. Once gathered up, the aliens separated the population into two groups. The first group was the elderly and very young, those that appeared to be in their 60s or higher and anyone 10 and below. The second group was everyone in between. Thanks to full mobilization in anticipation of the invasion, there were few teenagers and young adults left even in rural America. But there were plenty of preteens and individuals over 30 with health issues. Everyone in group 2 was killed. Their bodies simply left where they fell. The aliens were exterminating anyone of fighting age, leaving behind only those too young or too old to fight. The Major believed they were planning on a re-education campaign once the war was settled, bringing in all the children into the fold and leaving the elderly behind to take care of them until the war was won. It was sickly efficient. But they hadn't gotten everyone of fighting age. Partisan movements had sprung up all over occupied America, and the couple knew of a group in this area. They hosted us while contact was made. It would be good to have help for what would come next. Days 39 to 44. They called themselves Wolverines, and I immediately liked this ragtag group of freedom fighters. Their leader Jonathan Wood was a veteran like me, but with a missing leg that technically disqualified him from the draft. He had one of those modern blade prosthetics though, and I think the army was in error because he moved like a ninja on that thing. Wood was a quiet, unassuming man, not particularly physically imposing but I was told he was a crack shot and ice cool under pressure. He led a ragtag group of teenagers and older adults, numbering about 12, and had made it their job to make hell for the enemy in occupied territory. Thanks to them, we found out that the aliens sent a regular supply convoy through this town. At first, the convoys had very little protection, making them easy prey for the Wolverines, but the aliens were proving quick learners, and we were giving them very hard lessons. Each convoy was now heavily protected, but Wood was confident we could destroy it and take our prisoner. It was a perfect opportunity, so we spent several days training and rehearsing our attack. The Major led us to a hidden supply cache of weapons and ammunition. Apparently, the military had left thousands of these all across America, so the fight could continue behind enemy lines. It was a page straight out of Germany's World War II playbook. They too had left behind hidden supply caches, so that partisan fighters could rise up and strike the invading Soviets from the rear. Days 45 through 49. We'd started calling ourselves Hubrak's Half Dozen, though technically we were only five plus the Major. Of the five, I was closest to Kershane and Marks. Both had been drafted during the initial round and were present on day zero when the aliens made landfall. Both had kept their cool and impressed the Major enough that he must have taken note as he snatched them up before grabbing me at the field hospital. I doubt our ragtag group had been his first choice, but the Major seemed to have done his homework. Marks had a mind for tech. I think the Major picked him in case we got our hands on alien hardware, though we were under strict orders to not do anything that might damage it until we got it back to friendly lines. Korshane was the opposite. Instead of calm and quiet, he was a bit of a hothead, but still dependable. He was our designated heavy gunner, carrying his M240 Bravo machine gun, with Marks as his assistant gunner. The Major split us up into two teams of three, with myself, Marks, and Korshane together. It was our team that observed when the war changed course for the first time. It was a cloudy night, the three of us wrapping up training with our assigned Wolverines. You could hear the distant roar of jet engines somewhere above, another B-52 strike behind enemy lines. 
For whatever reason, the aliens weren't able to shoot down from space, probably because they never imagined they'd have to. Instead, they learned to shoot up. A bright beam of blue light shot up into the sky from somewhere far away, and then there was a dull roar and a bright flash of orange light. The aliens had deployed some type of very high-energy laser system. Just like that, the Air Force was off the front lines. From then on, they'd only be launching standoff attack munitions from well past the range of these blue death beams. The air advantage we'd enjoyed just got nullified, but what was most chilling to me was just how quickly the aliens had adapted and deployed new technology. If we were going to win, we needed to do it. Fast. Day 50. When under ambush, the winning tactic is to turn into the ambush and assault through it. Remaining in the kill zone is only going to get you dead. This is not what the aliens did. A couple of bricks of C4 were enough to destroy the lead vehicle, some sort of heavy IFV. The heavy armor still allowed the elf infantry to dismount from the rear, though I only counted 8 out of 14 possible passengers. Didn't matter, because they were cut down as Crochane opened up with the 240. A second explosion rung out from the second set of hidden C4, disabling the rear vehicle. Two javelins reached out and smashed into the escort IFVs, but only one managed to kill. The other was disabled, but still deadly, as we quickly found out when it turned its turret and opened fire on one of the javelin teams, shredding them with those weird glowing cannon rounds. Since we were in such close quarters, the javelins couldn't hit in top attack mode. At just over 80 yards, we could only hit them in direct attack mode, targeting the thinner side armor. A third javelin silenced the Elf IFV, knocking the deadly turret out of the fight just a few seconds too late. The Elf infantry carried weird, long, skinny rifles, which reminded me of the way they themselves were built. But what came out of them packed a wallop. Their rounds could punch through light cover, as many of our troops had found out the hard way, so you had to make sure you had something solid like brick or stone between you and them. They fired a lot faster than our rifles, but like their ship-mounted turrets suffered from accuracy issues. The M4 has no such accuracy issues, and the US Army places a premium on marksmanship for its infantry. Even our partisan friends were proving to be crack shots. You'd have to be to survive a month behind enemy lines. The firefight was brief and furious, but we were supposed to take one alive. That meant getting up close and personal. I called out to one of the Wolverines and had him take over Mark's role feeding Corshain ammo and the two of us dashed downstairs from the roof we'd been using as our base of fire. We had a pair of basic short-range walkie-talkies, and I sent the code word out to Major Hubrak. Geronimo. We were going in for a snatch and grab. A few moments later, the volume of fire from our side rose significantly. They were forcing the aliens to take cover and screen our approach. We dashed out a rear door and ran down a block of buildings to come out from behind them at the tail of the ambush kill zone. The rearmost IFV was here, a smoking wreck from the C4 booby trap and I scanned for any wounded with no luck as we rushed up behind it. The Wolverines and Crochane were doing a good job keeping the elves' heads down. We could see a group of them trying to return fire while taking cover, too preoccupied to see us rush up behind them. We scanned up and down the line of vehicles, counting 16 dead elves. The survivors seemed to be in three groups, and the one in front of us was separated by line of sight from the other two. I radioed Major Hubrak, giving him a very brief synopsis of my plan. He sent back a simple affirmative. We kept our transmission short, using lots of code words, just in case the aliens had learned to listen for our comms and were learning English. On the Major's order, a series of grenades exploded out of our line of sight and somewhere near the first and second group of L's. That was our signal, and Marks and I stepped out from behind cover, rifles at the ready. The aliens' entire focus was on the heavy fire they were receiving from the rooftops, but at the last moment one of them must have turned around to reload his weapon or something, because he spotted Marks and I and started hooting out in that strange melodic way. It was too late. Marks and I opened fire, two in the chest and one in the head. Four elves in this position, three dead within seconds. The survivor seemed in a state of shock as I rushed forward knocking his weapon out of his hands and bringing the butt of my rifle down on his head. He was out, and Marks helped me drag him back toward the building, seizing his rifle as a bonus prize. Then it all went to hell. A strange metallic sound, bright flashes and heat. We were inside a building when it happened or else I'm sure we would have been toast alongside most of the wolverines. I barely had time to look outside and see the large spinning disc-shaped aircraft as it dropped another salvo of those large glowing spikes, annihilating both friend and foe. The aliens had learned how to use air support. Maybe not expertly, but they killed a lot more of ours than their own. Days 51 to 56. Of our original squad, only Major Hobrook, myself, Marks, and Crushane remained. Wood and a handful of Wolverines lived, most of them injured. The greatest casualties had come from the strange flying craft dropping those rods all over the place, 
hitting friend and foe and leveling several blocks of buildings. It was overkill, but I guess the aliens were getting annoyed at how many casualties they were taking during an operation at what was supposed to be their safe rear areas. Well, welcome to war, human style. I thought I'd accidentally killed our alien friend. It took him over a day to come to. We treated his head wound best we could, but truthfully knowing very little about alien biology, there wasn't much we could have done if he'd been seriously injured. Luckily, it seemed he only had a mild concussion. While we licked our wounds, nobody talked to him. The Major wanted to isolate him, soften him up mentally for the long trip back to friendly lines. I got the feeling this wasn't the first time the Major had dealt with high-value enemy captives. Days 57 to 60 We offered for Wood to join us on our journey back to the front. Maybe the Army didn't want him before because of his leg, but he'd more than proven his worth. Besides, something told me the US Army was currently experiencing severe manpower shortages. Reluctantly, he agreed. There weren't enough healthy Wolverines to continue operating behind enemy lines. It would be safer for them to cease activities here anyway. If the Elves were willing to inflict that much collateral damage as a fire support mission, what would they do to local civilians in retaliation to more raids? Gathering our prisoner, we left for the long march back to friendly lines. Days 61 to 63. At first we only traveled at night, but then we realized our elf friend was having obvious difficulty seeing in bright daylight. It made sense, the Major said, because of those large black eyes. They were clearly meant to gather as much light as possible, so the aliens must have evolved in a low-light planet. Given that they probably had superior night vision technology anyway, it only made sense to travel when they'd be naturally disadvantaged. The fact that our friend was slightly more sluggish in the day made us suspect the species might be nocturnal. Or maybe he just had bad jet lag after crossing millions and millions of miles of empty space. He, she, it, it didn't talk much. It seemed to accept its fate, not even putting up a struggle when we got up each dawn to march. The Major kept it fed with what seemed like rations he'd salvaged from one of the destroyed vehicles, but I could tell he was limiting its food, keeping it strong enough to walk but too weak to resist. Again, I got the impression this wasn't the first time the Major had done this sort of thing. Days 64 to 69. We couldn't be too far from the front now because we could hear the sounds of battle in the distance. It was the unmistakable sound of armored vehicles, both alien and human, clashing in what must have been one titanic jousting match. Looking through binoculars, we could even spot a formation of elf artillery, spitting its strange but deadly globs of green glowing stuff that exploded with terrible force when it hit the ground. Whatever it was, it expanded after impact and then just vaporized everything within its blast radius. I'd seen even Abrams' tanks cut neatly in half. The alien artillery lobbed round after round downrange, but then suddenly explosions broke out amongst the concentration of guns. Counter-battery fire. I guess the green glowing crap did register on radar, and our boys were quick on the trigger. The enemy had yet to learn how to shoot and scoot. It was far too dangerous to travel, so we set up camp hidden in a grove of woods and monitored the situation from afar. The battle lines seemed to stay pretty much the same, and our vantage point gave us a great view of the enemy's rear areas where they were towing damaged vehicles and even setting up what I was guessing a field hospital or a command post. I was itching to get on the radio so we could broadcast their coordinates, but the Major vigorously refused. The elves could track our signal and bringing this one back alive was more important than one or two fire missions. Three days after setting up camp to wait for the battle to end, the elves set up new artillery, this time further back from the front and closer to us. This time it got eradicated by long-range cruise missile strikes. The aliens were learning very hard lessons, and it seemed like no matter how much of their equipment was destroyed, it just kept on coming. They'd have to run out eventually, right? Days 70 to 73. The battle finally ended, and I don't think we were on the winning side given the fact that a steady stream of elf vehicles and troops was slowly moving toward the former sounds of battle. Another retreat by US forces with the aliens moving troops up to secure newly taken territory. The Major tried to cheer us up. The US was trading territory for time, he said, overextending the enemy by waging a slow fighting retreat. It made sense, and I hoped he was right, and we weren't an actual full-blown retreat. We kept our friend gagged while enemy troops were near, though we never showed any sign of wanting to escape or call out for help. Major Holbrook suspected that this species was unified to the point of utter codependency. Humans are naturally independent, occasionally working together. The elves seem to be the exact opposite, naturally dependent and occasionally working alone. Explains why they never learned how to wage war on their own planet. With the battle ended, we set out again but detoured far to the east so as to avoid what must have been a former front, now swarming with elf supply and logistics troops. Our best chance was to slip through a crack in the front lines and hopefully not get shot down by our own guys while doing it. Days 74 to 79. I think I've learned the words for bathroom break and food in elf speak. Well, it'd be more accurate to call them sounds instead of words. 
because it seems like the entire elf language is a mix of melodic sounds that reminded me of wind chimes and whale songs. The shorter the sound, the more urgent the meaning seemed to be. How the hell were we going to decipher this language and ever communicate was well beyond me. We avoided population centers on our way to cross the front, and I was glad to. I knew what was waiting in those freshly occupied cities and towns. The corpses of anyone young enough to fight and then a ghost town full of elderly and very young. It was unsettling to an extreme degree, and I wondered why the elves didn't simply kill everyone off. What did they want humans alive for? Why did they even invade our planet with all that real estate available in the galaxy? I'd eventually find out why, and once again I wish I'd never had. Days 80 to 82 We ran into an enemy patrol completely by accident, and maybe we'd become too complacent. The elves didn't seem to leave the main roads and thoroughfares much, and we'd never seen sign of them deep in the woods that we were using to cover our travel. More than likely though, we were just tired, physically and emotionally exhausted, as we contemplated the fate of not just our nation, but our world. Our two groups nearly ran head on into each other as we both turned a corner at the same time on the heavily forested dirt road. The lead alien gave a soft hoot of surprise as he nearly collided with Major Hobrook, who was taking point. Our two groups stood still for a moment in utter shock. Our captive gave off what sounded like an inquisitive hoot. But the Major didn't freeze like the rest of us did, his instincts kicked in, immediately disarming the lead elf and sending an elbow into his solar plexus or whatever the aliens had in place of a solar plexus. Human martial arts had yet to adapt to alien physiology, but the attack worked as the alien crumpled at the Major's feet gasping for breath. The rest of us then raised our rifles and started firing nearly blank range at each other. Marks went down in a hail of alien gunfire, and with an enraged roar, Crochane unloaded in them. His heavy 240 had gotten slagged by the alien aircraft during the ambush, and he opted to travel instead with an older but much lighter M249 light machine gun. His 249 barked out 5.56mm rounds at a rate of 200 rounds a minute, all of them at terrifyingly close range. Accuracy was shit as he hip-fired the weapon. But then again, his targets were literally feet in front of him. Four of the aliens were cut down, with the Major narrowly avoiding being hit himself. I turned my attention on the fifth surviving alien who had dove for cover in the tree line, popping off several rounds as I plunged in after him. The brush was thick. I couldn't let him get away and let his buddies know we were out here. As I crashed past a thick bush, the elf nearly took my head off with a large, thin blade. I ducked under it by instinct and raised my rifle, and nothing. Misfire. The alien lunged again, and I managed to stop his downward thrust into my chest by grabbing onto the hilt of his weapon. Despite being thin and lanky, the elf was surprisingly strong, but obviously lacking self-defense skills. I grabbed his wrist and swept his legs out from underneath him, tumbling him to the ground. With a quick jerk, I heard the satisfying snapping sound of a wrist breaking, causing him to drop his blade and give off a series of low moans. Then I grabbed my own knife, put a knee in his chest, and… stopped. What now? I'd never killed in close quarters before, and even if this was an alien, it was still a living being. Killing someone through a rifle scope or even iron sights is one thing, but this… this felt like murder. The Major and Wood came crashing through the woods. I could hear Crochane howling in fury somewhere on the road behind them. Wood carried our prisoner in tow. What do I do with this one? I asked the Major. His answer was brief and decisive. With one smooth motion, he whipped out his sidearm and put a round through the alien's forehead. Can't bring another one with us. Too much risk. Days 83 to 87. Crochane wasn't the same after Marx's death. The two had been polar opposites, Marx quiet and reserved, Crochane loud and fiery, but they developed a pretty solid bond. I worried about the way he was handling his grief. I also worried he'd snap our captive's neck one night while we made camp. Our elf friend too seemed changed after the firefight in the woods. He'd been cooperative the entire time, or at least non-resistant. Now he just seemed defeated. His shoulders noticeably slumped as we walked along. Maybe we killed someone he knew. Maybe he wasn't even a real soldier, just some supply grunt that had been given a gun and told to help protect his convoy. Or maybe he had an idea of the fate that awaited him once we crossed the front and had seen his last chance for salvation come and go. I was surprised to find myself pitying the strange pinkish alien. After traveling with the Major for three months, I knew that whatever awaited him could not be good. One part of my brain said we had a war to win, at any cost, it was literally the survival of the species at stake. The other part of me, the part that used to look up at the night sky and wonder instead of terror, wondered just what made us humans to begin with. Were we risking losing that just to win? If we were willing to do the horrible things I was sure was coming to this elf, did we deserve to survive? Days 88 to 91 We must have crossed the front without even realizing it because we were found by our own people. I nearly opened fire by reflex when the recon squad of marines seemed to materialize from out of the bushes ahead of us and around us. The aliens had been trying to infiltrate behind enemy lines the way we did. 
they just weren't any good at it. The marines guided us at a fast clip through secret forest paths to a small clearing. Fifteen minutes later, a Black Hawk came flying in very low and very fast. The marines yelling at us to hurry up and load in. The chopper would loiter for only 30 seconds and definitely leave without us on it, if we weren't on board by then. Seems the aliens had gotten a lot better at targeting aircraft even across the front lines. Flying at dizzying speeds at what I swear was only inches above the treetops, I found myself breathing a sigh of relief, the first one in nearly three months. Days 92 to 96 Rest and relaxation, medical treatments for wounds and bug bites, plenty of chow for reconstitution. Despite being in the middle of a fight for the planet, life was temporarily pretty good. The Major and our elf friend were nowhere to be seen, though. We were somewhere outside of Denver. We'd first engaged the aliens somewhere just over the border in Kansas. They pushed us back nearly 200 miles. While recovering, we got caught up on how the war was going. The aliens had made major landings between San Diego and Los Angeles, outside Seattle, Las Vegas, Amarillo and Austin, Texas, Asheville, North Carolina, Atlanta, Baltimore, and Randolph in New York State. We had defeated one minor landing somewhere in Pennsylvania, eradicating the entire invasion force and seizing several surviving pieces of equipment for study. Though all the landings had been opposed, our forces were in slow but steady retreat at every location except Washington. The Baltimore landing had succeeded in taking the city, but the U.S. Army had held the alien offensive at bay outside Washington, D.C. The Air Force had paid a particularly gruesome toll for the successful defense of the city, flying combat missions even in the face of those new laser beam cannons. The offensive to take the political heart of the United States was halted, at least for now. Everywhere else was fighting retreat, trading territory for time. The rest of the world didn't seem to be faring much better, though it was getting harder and harder to communicate. The aliens had finally started to dismantle our communications networks. We had contact with Europe through undersea cables the aliens seemed unaware of. The Cold War had prepared us well for an alien invasion, as NATO envisioned how to fight and coordinate a strategy in a world ravaged by complete nuclear warfare. The European Union had lost all of Eastern Europe. Nobody had heard much from the Russians since Moscow fell. There were confirmed reports of nuclear detonations from the direction of Russia, though. To date, they seemed the only power to resort to nukes. The Galeans apparently didn't like that much. Rumors are they dropped several building-sized asteroids on Russian cities in response. It seems as though they were willing to put up with every underhanded tactic we had except nukes, which means they wanted our world intact and relatively unpoisoned. News from Asia was sporadic. The Japanese were fighting for every inch of their island, and given the aliens absolute hell, China communicated sporadically with the West. Aliens had seized Shanghai and Hong Kong, along with a few other major cities. Beijing stood strong and free. Like in every other occupied territory, though, the reports were all the same. All men and women of fighting age were exterminated, only the elderly and children remained. Days 97 to 99. Something big was brewing, and I feared it was another retreat. Nobody was hurrying to pack up equipment, though, but no one would tell Korshane and I what was going on. They wouldn't even answer the request to be sent back to the front. It felt terrible, sitting and stuffing our faces, while we knew people were out there fighting and dying to stop the elf threat. We were approximately 75 miles behind the front, safe enough for aircraft to operate. When I checked the flight line, I was surprised to find several rows of F-35s parked there, being serviced by technicians. That night, I heard the distinct sound of helicopters arriving and settling down somewhere outside the perimeter of the base. Something was going on, something big. We were going on the offensive. My suspicions were confirmed when the Major entered our temporary quarters with a broad smile on his face. Boys, how'd you like to save the world? Day 100 Despite there being 13 helicopters all loaded with troops, you could barely hear the sound of the specially modified Blackhawks. Outfitted with stealth coatings and all manner of electromagnetic disruption devices, unless the aliens knew exactly where to look, they'd never see us coming until it was too late. Seated next to me, Korshane grinned at me. Despite our losses, spirits were up. Despite our nation being overrun by alien invaders, spirits were up. Despite the Earth's fate hanging on a thread, spirits were up. Military intelligence had figured out the alien language surprisingly fast and interrogated our captive thoroughly. Now for the first time since the elves set foot on our planet, we were finally on the offensive, and our pink friend had given us one hell of a target. Much has been said about great monuments around the world that are so magnificent in their structures that it boggles the mind how the ancients built them. According to some left-field theorists, people didn't build them at all, but aliens descended from the skies in what some have called giant eggs or boats, and it was those beings that actually built the structures. Well, if not built them, then directed the construction. That's how a pyramid could be made sitting at true north, say the theorists. They go one step further, 
II, telling us that the pharaohs were actually alien-human hybrids. Sounds pretty far-fetched, but what's leading some to make these claims? Is there any evidence at all? Let's take a look at why some people believe this. As you may have seen in our other shows on the pyramids, to some Egyptologists the question of how the pyramids were built still remains shrouded in mystery. We're not only talking about the hard labor of moving millions of stones, dragging them across the land, and then up the foundation, but the absolute precision in regards to just how they lie. The fact that the pyramids of Giza sit true north should be astounding to just about anyone, not just conspiracy theorists. While others who have studied the structure insist that this great monument was precisely built to reflect the dimensions of our planet. There are critics of this theory and they state that if you shuffle the numbers enough, you can get the results you want to fit your theory. Nonetheless, with the pyramids being so incredibly majestic, it's certainly understandable that some people think that humans had a helping hand from something not of this world. Slightly more down to earth but still outside of the mainstream theorists have their own hypothesis, saying it wasn't aliens that did the work, but prior to the ancient Egyptians another advanced civilization existed on earth that had passed on their knowledge to them. Before we turn to the alien hybrid pharaohs, let's look at some other reasons why a certain segment of the public believes aliens came down to earth, left, and then were worshipped as gods by ancient civilizations. For starters, we have the Moai of Easter Island and the giant stone heads that certainly couldn't have been easy to erect. There's plenty of evidence that it was possible for the Moai to build these statues, but there are still those that state that they were built in the shape of the aliens who lent a hand in their construction. Then there's the ancient Bolivian temple Pumapunku, which was built with stones weighing over 100 tons. Even today, scientists are in disagreement as to how humans moved them. The stones in the temple fit together like an interlocking puzzle, and this would have meant those builders had to have possessed a profound understanding of geometry and masonry. Not only that, the incredible intricate decorations in the stones are so outstanding experts don't really know how they managed to make them with such basic tools. Tests on mummies have shown that people in the area regularly consumed hallucinogenic plants, and to some theorists this was their way of connecting to another world, which might help explain their brilliant inspiration. We won't go through all the great wonders on this planet Earth, but there are many historical sites that boggle the mind. Take for example Stonehenge in the UK, or the temples of Vijayanagara in India that seem to have alien looking figures and objects carved into the stonework. We are by no means attempting to sway you into thinking that just because humans in the past showed that they could do incredible things that it means that they had help from aliens. But we're merely saying that this is a reason why some people believe this might have happened. Back to the Egyptians. Have you ever seen a picture of Pharaoh Akhenaten, the father of King Tut, who was said to have been the living embodiment of the solar deity and who died around 1336 BC? There are many remaining artifacts that depict what Akhenaten looked like, and you know what? He has an elongated head, much like the average grey alien. You can find one stone carving of him worshipping the disk of the sun, known as the Aten, with the beams of light light shining down on him. Looking at this though, with his elongated head looking rather alien-like, if you didn't know better, you might think that the great disc was actually a spaceship, some kind of flying saucer. Of course, this is a long shot, and if you read more about ancient civilizations, you'll find that depicting people with elongated heads happened a lot, from the Australian Aborigines to the Mayans to many other places. Some have suggested that this might have been because they actually did have big heads, a deformation called macroacephaly that basically means big head in ancient Greece. Greek. This might have been the result of inbreeding or disease that led to the abnormality. It may have also been done on purpose. Cranial deformation might have also been a very painful procedure, something that children of noble birth had to go through to make them look unlike their ordinary folks. The theory is that it gave leaders to be great prestige. Whatever the reason, there's a lot of evidence of ancient people having these large heads all over the world. Some people would have you believe that these people were alien hybrids, or at least fashioned to look like the great things that came from the sky. There's no real solid evidence for this though, it's mere speculation or more like fantasy. As for the great Akhenaten, did he really have an enlarged head? Surely his mummy would tell us this, but we'll get around to that soon. Then there are the fantasies of the British tabloid press, who have at times not let the facts get in the way of telling a good tale, to put it politely. In 2016, some of the tabloids published an article about an ancient Egyptian coin that was unearthed. If you look at it, there's no doubt that one side portrays the elongated head of a grey alien, 
The problem with this is the fact that the only evidence of the coin being real was a line that told us the artifact was discovered by a group of people who worked on the renovation of a house in southern Egypt. We looked for more information at all on this mysterious group of renovators and couldn't find anything. We did though find coin experts talking about the alien head piece of cash and they said this, a little research revealed that it's not even a real artifact but a heavily retouched or photoshopped image of an actual Roman medallion in the famous collection of the Cabinet de Médaille in Paris. The hoax was uncovered by computer scientist Ralph Bulo. So much for trustworthy news sources. We found another dubious source telling us that DNA tests of Egyptian mummies revealed a gene called CXPAC5, which we're told is responsible for the building of the frontal cortex, the thinking part of the brain. Eight out of nine mummies didn't contain this, but the mummy of Pharaoh Ankhenaten did. The article then jumps to the conclusion that aliens must have planted this in the pharaoh. The blog post tells us that it's unusual to find CXPAC5 in the mummy of Akhenaten because he died at age 45, and it only appears in much older people. Akhenaten seemed to have an advanced brain. That said, we can find no one but alien enthusiasts talking about it. In fact, there are no links at all leading to the supposed study that tells us the pharaoh might have been linked somehow to aliens because of the appearance of this gene. Scientists are actually not sure where he was buried anyway, with it being suspected that he might have been laid to rest in KV-55, a tomb in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. One of the skulls found there was enlarged, but it's thought that this was because of a disease called chronic hydrocephalus. This basically means too much fluid on the brain and that can distort the cranium. Other experts say the ancients' enlarged heads could have been down to various syndromes that cause macrocephaly. Still, the reputable experts are still debating if the skull was Akhenaten's at all, and they certainly haven't put forth a theory that aliens had planted a gene in his head that made it larger or made him more intelligent. The alien believers certainly connected a lot of invisible dots to make that story work. Finally, there's the allegedly ancient Egyptian text called the Thule Papyrus. You'll find certain sources saying this contains script that looks like it talks about UFOs. One translation of part of the text reads in English, In the year 22, third month of winter, sixth hour of the day, the scribus of the House of Life found it was a circle of fire that was coming in the sky. Another part reads, They were more numerous than anything. They were shining in the sky more than the sun to the limits of the four supports of heaven. Powerful was the position of the fire circles. Wow, that certainly sounds like it might have been an account of an alien sighting. The only problem is, the Thule papyrus is not an authentic papyrus. It's a transcription of an alleged document of whose origin is dubious at best. Even some ufologists call the entire thing a hoax, saying someone was handed an ancient document and told it was a transcription of the original, and then someone translated that, and that's about it. In something called the Condon Report, a report by a group funded by the U.S. Air Force on the possibility of alien life coming to Earth, this Thule papyrus was talked about. The researchers wrote that it was taken from secondary and tertiary sources without any attempts to verify original sources. They also said that all such accounts of UFO sightings handed down from ancient times have proved to be weak and unverifiable. Until they can be verified, they're meaningless. From what we could see, a lot of people don't bother with the verification process, but are quite sure when writing their blogs from their bedrooms that they are right. Their evidence is like the Thule papyrus in digital form. Dubious evidence handed down and rewritten and copied and passed on. It makes for a good story, but until we have more evidence, that's all it is. A story. As you can see, a lot of people claiming that pharaohs were part alien or contacted by aliens are connecting a lot of dots that don't necessarily mean much except in their own minds. They already have a picture they want to see, but science doesn't work by starting from a conclusion and finding evidence to back it up. It's the opposite. We look at the evidence we have and use that to come to conclusions. With that, we'll finish with a quote. In the words of astrophysicist Carl Sagan, in the long litany of ancient astronaut pop archaeology, the cases of apparent interest have perfectly reasonable alternative explanations, or have been misreported, or are simple prevarications, hoaxes, and distortions. The area we are going to talk about today is shrouded in secrecy, and for that reason it has become the focus of conspiracy theorists. Is it a hiding place of aliens and weather control technology? Or is it merely a location where the USA develops highly advanced military machinery? It is often referred to as a black site, where black projects take place with black basically meaning highly classified. Today we'll look at one of the most mysterious black sites in the world. In this episode of the Infographic Show, what do we know about Area 51? We are told it's called Area 51 because it was named that in some documents pertaining to the Vietnam War. 
The Central Intelligence Agency gives it a far less mysterious name and calls it Homey Airport and Groom Lake. This is a restricted area in Nevada, about 83 miles northwest of Las Vegas. In 1955, the site was first used for flight testing, but what happens there now is largely unknown. The down-to-earth theory is that the US conducts secret military exercises there, which includes the testing of weapons that are in development. The reason it remains so secret, of course, is because the US doesn't want any of these experiments falling into the hands of its real or possible enemies. Before we get into any of the more outlandish theories about Area 51, we'll tell you what we do know for a fact. First of all, it's a restricted area, but according to most sources we can find, it is not as heavily guarded as you might expect. You can follow a dusty desert road close to the area, but at some point you'll find no entry signs that warn trespassers they could take the brunt of deadly force if they go any further. It is patrolled, but not as aggressively as you'd think, and it's more likely you'll be told to go back or receive a fine rather than be shot at if you wander into the site. You can't fly over it, and if you attempt to fly a drone over there, you will no doubt get in trouble. According to some sources, the area is surrounded by cameras and sensors with one website stating the base knows every desert tortoise and jackrabbit that hops the fence. You can get up to the gates, however, and you'll have to follow the aptly named Extraterrestrial Superhighway to get there. We found there is even an adult entertainment club called the Alien Cat House just west of Area 51. What we are trying to say is that it's not as off the grid as you might think. Okay, so we now know what kind of place we're looking at, but what happened there in the beginning? It was a child of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. The US wanted to test its military equipment in a far off place. The military wanted personnel and engineers to go and work there, and for that reason, so we are told, they gave it the nice sounding name of Paradise Ranch. The first testing would be of a high altitude reconnaissance aircraft known as the U-2 program, Soon the locals would spot weird things in the air, or pilots would see strange high-flying aircraft, and this is where the speculation started regarding aliens and such. Because the government could say nothing about this, the UFO theories seemed almost credulous. Since then, all manner of covert operations have taken place at Area 51, which you can find by looking at declassified documents. These include building and testing the Bird of Prey Black Project stealth aircraft in the 90s. There are too many projects to mention, but no doubt aircraft are still being secretly built and tested there today. The latest developments are all secret, but you can check those declassified documents to see what went down there in the past. According to one expert, he believes present projects involve more exotic forms of radio communication, directed energy weapons, and lasers. So what is all the fuss about? Well, some people believe it's much more than a place where aircraft is developed and advanced weapons tested, but a site where the USA's biggest secrets are kept, such as where the moon landings were filmed and faked. It's not the moon landings, however, that have attracted the most attention. It's aliens. If you've seen our show on Roswell, and those people that say they saw aliens at the Roswell site, one might wonder what happened to our little green friends. Well, perhaps they were taken to Area 51 and still remain there now. Does that sound crazy to you? It might sound crazy if you haven't heard of the name Bob Lazar. Lazar is a 59-year-old American engineer that told the world he had worked on reverse engineering several flying saucers. He made this public at first under a pseudonym when his face was blacked out in an interview on American TV in 1989. He also claimed he had been given briefing documents explaining that he'd be dealing with aliens from the southern constellation of Reticulum and that these aliens had been on Earth for around 10,000 years. To power their aircraft, they used the unknown element, Element 115. Lazar's critics say he falsified his academic records, but Lazar says they were wiped by the government. The only evidence is his testimony, but it must be said he is now a businessman and has no history that we can find of mental illness. In a recent interview, he said, Look, I know what happened is true. There is no doubt, period. Of all the conspiracy theories, this has the most credibility, only because this supposed whistleblower seems to have no reason to lie and does have a background that could put him inside Area 51. Whatever the case, his words certainly kicked off years of speculation as to what goes on in there. From that point on, many people, without entering solid proof, have said that the site is riddled with underground tunnels leading to warehouses full of alien technology and even captured aliens. But not all the theories involve big-headed green men on a protracted vacation to planet Earth. Others believe a group called the Majestic 12, who we discussed in our Illuminati show, actually disseminate alien stories about the base because it's really being used to hatch their plan of ruling over the world. Aliens are a cover, a diversion story. How will they rule the world? Well, they might start by depopulating the planet. 
One of the conspiracy theories out there about Area 51 is that it is the place where weather control is developed and practiced. Before you get carried away, we should mention that many projects of the USA have been involved with weather control, including Project Cirrus and Project Storm Fury, and while these were benign, who's to say similar weather control projects couldn't be used more nefariously? That's what the doomsday believers tell us, anyway. What about the fake moon landings? Why was that flag waving in the wind when there is no wind on the moon? NASA says it's because the flag was being twisted by Buzz Aldrin. Was filmmaker Stanley Kubrick in on the deal? Much cheaper to hire him than actually go to the thing. There are countless theories out there stating that the landing was a hoax, but these have so far all been debunked. We don't have time to go through them all, but you can easily find them on the web. One of the non-conspiracy related issues involving Area 51 is that around the site there is a lot of radioactive waste and people have actually died from radiation poisoning. Civilians who work there have complained of rashes, racking coughs, or dreadful skin conditions. This has led to lawsuits being filed. In 2013, the LA Times called this the real cover-up. So yes, the American government is certainly working on some very experimental things in Area 51, and what goes on in there is kept secret for a reason. It's anyone's guess as to what is happening as you are watching this show, but there can be no doubt it is related to destructive forces. You may have your own theories or can provide more information as to the conspiracy theories, but we certainly cannot find any competing evidence that supports some of the more outlandish stories. September 20th, 2019, the day that the people of Earth discover that the US government has been hiding the presence of extraterrestrials from the public. Our millennia of intergalactic solitude has finally come to an end, and the greatest question ever asked by science has at last been answered. Are we alone? For decades, the people of Earth have been visited by aliens from another planet, who have worked in secret cooperation with the United States government. These aliens have crossed the vast distances of intergalactic space with mind-bending technologies in order to mutilate cows, show up as blurry blobs in videos, and conduct experiments on abductees involving probes in very uncomfortable places. The truth is no longer out there, it's finally here, or in the open. Or perhaps September 20th, 2019 will merely be the day that many hundreds of misled people get arrested for trespassing by the US government, earning hefty fines, long sentences in a federal prison, and ending up with experiments involving probes in very uncomfortable places of a totally different sort. Today we're going to look at the phenomenon that has swept the internet, the massive plan to raid Area 51 and plunder it of its alien secrets, and turn to a friend of the show and former security expert for the US military as he tells us why storming Area 51 is a terrible idea. On June 27th, a Facebook event hosted by three different Facebook accounts appeared publicly, entitled simply Storm Area 51. They can't stop all of us. The event would later be claimed by a Maddie Roberts as having been started in jest, but the joke very quickly caught on and went global. As of this writing, 1.7 million people have signed on to the event, and another 1.3 million are interested. The official date is set for September 20th, 2019 for the hours between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. While Roberts has come forward and explained that it was a joke, he did so only after the event skyrocketed in popularity and out of fear that should something really happen that the US government would be looking for him for being the ringleader. He wanted to publicly declare that the event was a joke and he was in no way serious about storming Area 51. Whether he was serious or not is likely not to matter come September 20th with the event gaining popularity around the world. While most people signed on to the event as a satirical joke, it's clear from the Facebook page for the event that there are plenty of people who see the opportunity to rush the secretive restricted area in mass as a way to at last plunder its secrets. The rallying cry of, they can't stop us all, has made many people take the event seriously, and it's now feared that on September 20th a large group of people will make a serious attempt to enter the secretive base. Recently, the US Air Force sent out a message addressing the online joke, warning that any attempts to illegally access the area is highly discouraged. So could enough people breach the secret base's defenses? What would happen if they did? And why all the hoopla over Area 51 anyways? Area 51 is situated in a remote corner of the Nevada Test and Training Range at Groom Lake, 
which is a large expanse of desert where US pilots hone their abilities dropping live and dummy ordnance on ground targets. It was so remote in fact that it quickly became the premier destination for developing new and advanced planes for the CIA and the US Air Force. It was, for instance, where the infamous U-2 spy plane was originally developed, a technological marvel of its time which flew so high that it was for years out of reach of Soviet fighters and missiles. The facility was also the home of the infamous Skunk Works, a group of engineers who developed some of the world's most advanced airplanes, and from which the likes of the SR-71 and the F-117 came from. Any other information to include if the legendary Skunk Works still operates from the site is difficult to verify, as the entire facility remains a highly classified secret and the US government barely even acknowledges its presence. Satellite imagery of the site though shows that indeed several buildings and flight lines have been constructed, and curiously enough, a flight line long enough to land even the biggest aircraft developed anywhere in the world is clearly visible. Others claim that you can see in some satellite images how the flight lines lead to underground bunkers, though the veracity of those claims is dubious at best. If alien life was visiting planet Earth and the United States government had in fact gotten its hands on some of that alien tech, or was cooperating with aliens, it seems that Area 51 would be the ideal place for such activity. The site is notoriously remote and difficult to get to, miles away from any road and difficult to spy on due to the mountains that border it. But could you penetrate it and if you did, what would happen? Our expert warns us immediately that any attempt to penetrate a restricted military facility comes with serious consequences. This isn't Stranger Things, this is real life, and trying to get into a restricted area can land you with serious jail time, huge fines, or worse. Trespassing on a restricted military facility can carry a penalty of up to 10 years in federal prison and is often accompanied by a fine of tens of thousands of dollars, which you will be obligated to pay before or after your prison sentence. Naturally though, the condition of your trespass is often taken into consideration, with our expert telling us that if it's clear you were inadvertently trespassing then you would likely simply be apprehended, searched, debriefed, and then driven back to a point outside of the facility and be freed to go. If however your trespass was purposeful, you might get the book thrown at you, specifically if it seemed like your trespass was malicious malicious in nature, as in you were actively trying to steal government materials or secrets. Different restricted areas have different levels of secrecy however, and some places, termed black world facilities, are so secretive that your trespass and ensuing trial are all kept under the strictest of measures of secrecy, with no details of your trial becoming public knowledge. No, you're not tried by some secretive shadow court and condemned to the dark side of the moon, but rather your trial and everyone involved, including your lawyer and any witnesses, are all forced to sign extremely harsh confidentiality agreements, with very, very strict penalties for breaking them. That is, of course, if you are arrested, because our expert tells us that there is one more option for dealing with trespassers, and that's to simply shoot them. No, this isn't Soviet Russia where you can get shot for just hopping a fence to a military base, but our expert warns us that there are concentric rings of security around restricted facilities, and if you penetrate deep enough through those rings of security, you eventually hit one ring where deadly force is authorized, no questions asked. Of course, these areas are always very clearly marked by signs which state as much, so there's no chance you would wander into an area where you could just get shot for being there with no authorization. You would have to make the choice to continue pushing forward, despite the risks. The reason why these harsh measures exist is simple. Some secrets are so vital to national security that the government cannot risk their being discovered by foreign governments. Take for instance the Manhattan Project. If knowledge of how to build a working nuclear weapon was discovered by the Germans, the entire course of the war may have taken a radically different route. If you manage to penetrate the outer layers of security and get to those shoot first, ask questions later areas, then it means that you are there on a mission and you are likely seeking to cause great harm to the US. So what would happen if you joined 1.7 million people in rushing Area 51? Would you get to see dim aliens? First, our expert tells us that you would run into a sign warning you that you are entering into a restricted area, and typically warning you of the penalties for doing so. Most secretive government facilities aren't behind huge fences, as that would be far too obvious a giveaway, but rather they rely on extreme remoteness and large tracts of empty land to discourage anyone getting too close. Throughout this seemingly empty landscape are security patrols dispersed throughout the first two outer rings of security, and even if you don't see them, odds are that they see you. Armed with high-powered visual aids, night vision, and thermal imagers, 
These security personnel are vectored in on trespassers by sensors hidden under the ground, pressure sensors buried under avenues of approach, and seismic sensors throughout the entire outer perimeter give alarm operators perfect situational awareness of the miles of empty landscapes surrounding the secret facility, and typically a host of hidden high-power cameras allow them to spy on any portion of their perimeter. If trespassers are detected, they are typically allowed to wander through the first outer perimeter of security without being intercepted. That's because these areas are so large and remote that people wander in and out by accident all the time, and the security personnel at the facility prefer that you never even find out you had inadvertently strolled into somewhere you weren't supposed to. The entire time you're in the first ring of security though, you will be closely monitored from afar, sometimes even by air through drones, and likely not have a clue that you're being spied on. If, however, you continue forward, you will reach the second outer ring of security, much smaller than the first outer ring. The second ring is continuously patrolled by security personnel on foot or in vehicles, and penetrating it will result in a security patrol being immediately dispatched to apprehend you. Our expert tells us that you likely won't get too far through this second ring of security, as you'll have been carefully observed the entire time you approached it through the first ring. A patrol will move to your position and apprehend you, search you and your vehicles, and typically debrief you or just move you straight back to the outermost perimeter and warn you not to return. Should you somehow evade detection or capture though, you'll reach the inner ring of security, or at least the inner ring of the outer security zone, because there remains one more inner ring that's within the facility buildings itself. Here movement of personnel is highly restricted, even amongst the personnel who work at the facility. And even though you may have the clearance to work at one part of the facility, you may not have been cleared for any other part of the same facility. In this inner ring though, even the base staff have to be on high alert against straying where they don't belong. For you, a complete outsider who doesn't belong at all, straying into this area could be deadly. It's here that signs warning the use of deadly force are placed, and while it can be up to the discretion of the security commander or even the individual patrol that discovers you, you really don't want to press your luck. Remember, only really bad guys would be interested in getting this close to a secret facility, so any responding security personnel are going to assume that you're out to cause some serious harm to the US. We cannot stress enough how dangerous it would be to penetrate this area. These are all, of course, the outer layers of security, and inside each facility our expert tells us that even more stringent security measures exist, with even greater repercussions for violating them. He would not elaborate on inner security measures, but did tell us that many times the guards restricting access to the facility might themselves not have a high enough clearance to be inside the facility itself. That's how seriously classified some facilities are, and an entirely different team of guards with an even higher security clearance may be assigned to work the actual insides of the facility. Though our expert would not comment much on the inner workings of restricted facilities, he did leave us with this story. I was assigned to a facility with two outer doors, each with a more stringent set of security measures to verify your identity before you could pass. The outer door was open to the outside world and the second door, where I was located, was inside a small room connected to that first outer door. There was a scanner machine that worked automatically, and my job was twofold, ensure nobody trying to access the facility messed with the machine as it verified their identity and credentials, and if the machine ever set off an alarm I was to immediately terminate the individual attempting entry. Once the machine granted entry I was not allowed to look inside the open door and had to stand with my back to whatever the door opened up into. After speaking with our expert, it's clear that storming Area 51 would be a terrible idea. While group posts claim that they can't stop all of us, our expert warns that yes, they very much have the means and firepower to stop even a major incursion event, and that if whatever is inside Area 51 is of vital national security importance, then they will do just that. He warns us that the most sensitive of these facilities were designed to stop a full-scale military assault. Also, though he would not go into specifics, our expert told us that in all likelihood, even if you managed to defeat the outer security, you would simply be never able to access the actual facilities themselves as part of their security measures include the ability to completely lock out the outside world. If you've seen our shows on Roswell and Area 51, you already know some of the theories out there that support the position that aliens have already visited our beautiful blue planet. In Roswell, for instance, some people believe that aliens crash-landed and little green men were quickly taken away. Where are they now? Area 51, some conspiracy theorists tell us, and they have been used to help the American military create highly advanced military technology. But these cases are just touching the tip of the extraterrestrial iceberg. 
Today we'll dig a little deeper. In this episode of the Infographic Show, what is the likelihood aliens have already made contact? We'll start by noting that many stories make the rounds regarding whistleblowers who confessed that they have proof that we have been in touch with aliens, and many other stories are just plain old alien sightings. These may or may not be true. Many stories get debunked, and others are too preposterous to even gain traction. It's up to us, as amateur internet sleuths and part-time alien investigators, to look through the evidence and ascertain an opinion. We might take the case of former Lockheed Martin engineer and Area 51 scientist Boyd Bushman, who confessed on his deathbed that we had made contact with aliens. He even had photographs to prove it. He said two types of aliens were here on Earth, describing them as wranglers and rustlers, the former being friendlier than the latter. He said in his confession, which is available on YouTube, that a great deal of information should be lifted up from those dark recesses of Area 51 and moved over so people can see them. We watched the video, and he at least seems convincing. He shows photos he acquired of an alien craft and one of a four and a half foot to five foot tall alien with three backbones. He said at least 18 of them exist within Area 51. These aliens, he said, are telepathic. The problem is, the only evidence he has are these photographs, and as critics have pointed out, the pictures he holds up look like alien dolls that can be purchased here on Earth in stores. Many people decry this man as a loon, even though he was a highly intelligent engineer with patents to his name, while others have suggested that he was probably just suffering from senility. Of course, conspiracy theorists will tell you that this is just a smear campaign and that the smear further supports the existence of aliens. But the tale gets stranger when you invoke another Area 51 engineer who also said he had worked on alien technology, mainly reverse engineering alien spacecraft. His name is Bob Lazar, he is still alive and still stands by what he first said in 1989, that Area 51 was the location where several alien spacecrafts were kept. He also said aliens had been around on Earth for at least 10,000 years. Lazar is the person mainly responsible for starting the Area 51 conspiracies. While his educational background has come into question, Lazar has stated that the government wiped all his educational records to undermine his claims. We should add that former President Bill Clinton has also said he wouldn't be surprised if aliens had visited Earth, and said he'd even sent his people to Area 51 to look for signs of them. He concluded in a TV interview, there are no aliens there, but that won't appease the believers. You can hear more about Area 51 on our dedicated show. All this may sound even truer if you saw the recent anonymous video stating that NASA was about to tell us a big secret that it has discovered the existence of aliens. But Anonymous didn't actually tell us what NASA was going to say, and according to most media, its announcement was based on the fact that NASA has found lots of new planets in the last several years thanks to the Kepler telescope launched a few years ago. According to NASA, 20 of those planets are similar in size to Earth and could possibly sustain life. NASA calls the location of these planets the habitable zone, as water would not freeze there, nor would it burn up. But we should reiterate, Anonymous has yet to say anything to make us believe contact has already been made. So what about those people who say they have been up close and probed by aliens, what we call alien abduction? In a denunciatory manner, deceased American comedian Bill Hicks once pondered, why is it that aliens always land in rural America? They cross galaxies, or wherever they come from to visit us, and always end up in places like Fife, Alabama. Maybe these are not super intelligent beings, man. Maybe they're like hillbilly aliens, said Hicks. And while that was a joke, it should make us question the strange phenomenon of these abductions happening around the same areas in the United States. Is it hysteria? Psychosis? Well, psychological studies have shown that people who said they were abducted were not mentally ill. People have reported being abducted all over the world, but America easily leads the way. Are any of those abduction stories convincing? There are too many stories to mention, but most are similar. People are abducted, usually adults, then probed, sometimes taken on a tour, and then sent back. One of the most famous cases was that of American couple Barney and Betty Hill, who said they were abducted in 1961. The aliens, apparently from the Zeta Reticuli star system, had kind of mesmerized the couple as they were looking at its spacecraft while driving in a rural area. Moments later, they were 35 miles away, feeling all dazed and confused. Hours had gone by. The lapse of time became known as the missing time. It was only later that Betty recalled in her dreams that she had indeed been taken aboard the spacecraft and probed. 
The thing is, Betty's story, both fully conscious and under hypnosis, was not always the same, and later in life, she said she had seen aliens again on several occasions. Skeptics also believe that Barney only went along with Betty's story after she had told it numerous times, and it's believed Betty was a lifelong UFO fanatic. Even these days, you can find many people online that claim to have been abducted, but as of yet, there is no evidence that proves this is not merely a fantasy. Until there is, we must remain skeptical. What about the most credible sightings of alien spacecraft, aka UFO? These don't always come from Reddit users stating they saw something that no one else did. Sometimes they come from more than one person working in a professional field. We might look at the case of what was described by a US Navy pilot as a giant flying Tic Tac. Navy Commander David Fravor said in 2004 that he witnessed a white Tic Tac about the same size as a Hornet, 40 feet long with no wings, just hanging close to the water. Other pilots saw it too, and even filmed it. Fravor said that it was faster than I'd ever seen anything in my life, adding, we turn around, say, let's go see what's in the water, and there's nothing, just blue water. No one has said the video is not real, and indeed, the object looks like a massive Tic Tac. In fact, after the video emerged, a Pentagon official leading a program to search for UFOs said, My personal belief is that there is very compelling evidence that we may not be alone. He said his team had found mysterious aircraft that seemingly defy the laws of aerodynamics that couldn't, in human engineering terms, have the technology to fly. But they did fly. The flying Tic Tac and the Pentagon being so candid is probably the best evidence we have of aliens having visited us, but still, it's far from being indisputable evidence. Motherboard interviewed a man named Peter Davenport in 2017. Davenport is the director of the National UFO Reporting Center. If you see something strange in the sky, you call them. He says sightings have shot up in recent years, stating that most calls are serious-minded attempts to describe some type of object that the witness was unable to identify himself. The callers could sometimes be drunk and seem unreliable, but many calls come from people who hold positions of authority and are deadly serious. One such call came from a retired military fighter pilot who'd also been a commercial airline pilot and an astronaut. The caller said he'd seen a large, orange glowing orb moving rapidly overhead. In fact, if you read through the dialogue of numerous calls, you might just become a UFO believer. However, if the truth is out there, it's not exactly on our TVs, walking on the White House lawn and having cups of tea with the Queen of England. Given that so many planets surround us, and given the sheer fact that it would be ignorant of us to say we are the only ones existing in the universe, it would be foolhardy to deny the existence of aliens. Then again, it's also unlikely that if they had landed here, the authorities could prevent those aliens from being seen more widely. And if the aliens are that advanced, surely they could evade capture or even mess with our TV signals. UFOs and alien encounters have been reported since antiquity. Yet in the 1950s, an explosion of UFO sightings rocked the planet and continue to this day. Although they are often harmless events, there is a darker side to the UFO phenomenon. The alleged abduction or visitation of human beings by alien visitors. Hello and welcome to another special episode of the Infographics Show's Greatest Mysteries. Today we're taking a look at the alien abduction phenomenon with two of the most convincing cases of all time. Many abduction stories tell of aliens performing medical tests on their human test subjects, but some claim that the aliens are also interested in our mating habits or perhaps require our help in creating a race of human-alien hybrids. Whatever the reasoning, some alien abductees report sexual encounters during their abduction event, and few are more well-known than the first recorded abduction of the modern age, the abduction of Antonio Villas Boas. In early October 1957, Boas began seeing strange, bright lights in the sky around his family's farm in rural Brazil. On October 5th, just before midnight, Boas spotted a bright white light in the sky as he opened his bedroom window to get some fresh air. Later that night, after sleeping for a bit, Boas awoke and discovered the same light in the exact same position. Yet, as he looked at it, the light suddenly began to move toward him at a frightening speed. Terrified, he slammed shut the window shutters and woke up his brother, and the two watched as the bright light shined through the closed shutters before leaving. The light reappeared nine days later when Boas and his brother were out working in the fields at night to beat the daytime heat. This time, the light hovered about 300 feet above their head and moved from one end of the field to the other as the brothers approached to investigate. Suddenly, the light disappeared. 
as if having been turned off. Though Boa suggested that the light may have simply lifted up and rushed away while he wasn't looking. The next night, working in the fields alone, a reddish light zoomed out of the sky towards Boas at incredible speed. Before he could decide what to do, it had already stopped directly above his head, and Boas could see a craft that looked like a large, elongated egg. Three legs extended from underneath it as the craft began to descend, at which point a terrified Boas ran to his tractor. But upon reaching it, the tractor and its lights suddenly died. While Boas was fleeing for his house, a small figure suddenly grabbed his arm. According to Boas, the figure was dressed in a full body length suit of some kind, with an elongated helmet and what appeared to be breathing tubes connected to its bodysuit. Shaking off the figure, Boas turned to run again but was surrounded by three figures who overpowered him. Boas was taken to a flexible metallic rolling ladder, which whirred him up and into the spacecraft. Once inside, he found himself in a small, brightly lit square room. The aliens grabbed Boas and held him in place while they undressed him, and despite his opposition, the aliens seemed to take care not to harm him or damage his clothing as they patiently removed it. All the while, the aliens communicated between themselves, with Boas describing the sounds as some kind of animalistic grunts. The sounds were so foreign to Boas that when interviewed later, he had a difficult time describing or recreating them. Once naked, the aliens applied a clear liquid to his body, likely a disinfectant, and took blood with a device from his chin that left small scars later noticed by doctors. At this point, Boas said he was left alone for about an hour until suddenly a nude female figure entered the room. Described by Boas as human yet with features that, although beautiful, were not quite right. A device in the ceiling emitted a puff of smoke that made Boas nauseous initially, but he thought it acted as some sort of aphrodisiac. After engaging in intercourse with the alien woman, Boas was allowed to dress and return to his farm, but not before trying to secretly steal a small device from the ship as proof of his experience, which caused one of the aliens to react very violently. Boas' story could easily be dismissed as fantasy if not for the incredible amount of detail and his great reluctance in his telling it. It took Dr. Olavo Tifantes, professor of medicine at the National School of Medicine in Brazil, to convince Boas to go public with his story, after which he did to a journalist and a member of the Brazilian military intelligence. Along with the incredible amount of detail Boas offered about the aliens, their wardrobe and the craft itself, Boas was also found to be suffering from radiation poisoning, as he exhibited a plethora of other physical ailments for months after his experience. Was it an actual alien encounter, or was it the wild fantasy of a bored and possibly very lonely farmer? We'll let you decide as we move on to our second alien encounter. Made famous by the Hollywood film Fire in the Sky, the Travis Walton abduction story has become a hotbed of controversy. On November 5, 1975, Walton and five other loggers working in the Arizona wilderness piled into a truck for the drive home after a hard day's work. Minutes later, the crew spotted a bright light coming from behind a hill. Filled with curiosity, they drove closer until they could see a large, silvery disc hovering just above a clearing. While the others stayed in the truck, a fascinated Walton leapt out and ran toward the disc, ignoring the shouts from the rest of his crew to get away and come back. As Walton approached the disc, it suddenly began to make sounds like a loud turbine and wobble from side to side, scaring Walton who then began to back away. According to one of the men on Walton's crew, a beam of blue-green light shot out of the disc and struck Walton, sending him sprawling backwards. The terrified crew immediately put the truck into gear and hightailed it off the mountain and immediately called the police. Deputy Sheriff Chuck Ellison answered their call and came to meet the men, saying later that all of the men were distraught and two were in tears. Although skeptical of the story, he said if they were acting, they were awfully good at it. Within hours, a police search of the abduction site discovered nothing, and the next day an exhaustive search involving horses, helicopters, and jeeps still failed to discover anything. At this point, the police grew suspicious of the logging crew, believing the abduction story to be a cover for an accident or a murder. A polygraph test administered days later indicated that the men were not lying about their UFO sighting or that they had hurt Walton. Days later, a disoriented Walton called his brother-in-law, Grant Neff, from a public phone. Rushed to a hospital, Walton relayed a story of being examined by aliens similar to the popular greys described by other abductees and having an encounter with a strangely human-like male and female alien who would not answer his questions and at one point anesthetized him. 
A medical examination discovered a small puncture mark on his right arm consistent with a hypodermic injection, but it was nowhere near a vein. His urine also showed a lack of ketones, which if Walton had indeed been without food as he insisted, and as his weight loss suggested, should have been present as his body began breaking down fats in order to survive. To this day, Walton's story remains the stuff of controversy, with Walton failing a polygraph test on the TV game show called The Moment of Truth. Skeptics believe the entire story was made up for publicity, and also because Walton and his crew were severely behind in their logging contract. Walton's alleged abduction allowed them to secure an extension from the Arizona government. However, Walton's crew remained adamant for decades after the incident that the entire story was true. Even the police who first responded to their original frantic telephone call for help remarked at how visibly shaken and distraught the men appeared to be that night. Are aliens real? And if so, do they really routinely abduct humans for research? Should we be concerned? And should our governments be doing more to try to protect us from this terrifying threat? It's ultimately easy to dismiss alien abduction stories as mere fantasies made up out of boredom, for attention, or to get oneself out of trouble. But sometimes the physical evidence can be perplexing and begs the question, just how did a 1950s Brazilian farmer working his fields in the remote countryside end up with radiation sickness, skin lesions, and a host of other perplexing physical ailments? Man has been pondering the existence of aliens for some time. Even in ancient Rome, the poet Titus Lucretius Carus talked about not being alone in the universe. But throughout history, a person had to be careful about speculating on the existence of otherworldly beings given they might be called a heretic or crazy for doing so. No one really knows exactly when the little green men first appeared on the scene, but we could say that it was the 1950s that was the heyday for fictional stories about aliens, sometimes at the helm of flying saucers. This was an era of many sightings, and it seems those little creatures often chose the USA to do a flyover. One particular incident stands out from them all, and that's what we'll talk about today. In this episode of the Infographic Show, evidence that aliens did come to Roswell. It was the summer of 1947, and the people of Roswell, New Mexico, in the USA, were about to get the shock of their lives. It was a quiet place then, and still today there are only around 50,000 people living there. What occurred, though, became such a cause celeb that the place has kind of been turned into an alien-themed city. But what exactly did happen? Well, if you look at the front page of the Roswell Daily Record on July 8, 1947, the headline for the main story was, RAAF Captures Flying Saucer on Ranch in Roswell Region. Now that's the kind of headline that these days might elicit most people to say the words fake news. But back then, people were dead serious about the possibility of there being aliens in their midst. It all started on a hot afternoon when a rancher found some debris in his sheep field, and that debris, many people would speculate, was from an alien ship. What did this wreckage consist of? In 2013, The Guardian published a story about the death of a man called Jesse Marcel Jr., and he said he had gotten his hands on that debris as his father was part of the investigation. He'd lived an exciting life, traveling the world talking about the debris and aliens in general. His wife said this of him, he was credible. He wasn't lying, he never embellished, and only told what he saw. Both son and father believed the debris was not of this world, being taken aback by a strange-looking purple beam with hieroglyphics on it. There were also lots of metallic sticks, reflectors, and strips of a thin glossy material. What on earth could that be? The Air Force said there was nothing strange about it, and the wreckage was merely that of a weather balloon. You can see the pictures, however it certainly doesn't look anything like a weather balloon. But was it parts of a flying saucer? Many people seemed to think so, and accused the military of a cover-up. Matters weren't helped when the Air Force started doing dummy drops in the area throughout the 50s. As if they were purposefully stoking the imaginations of the local people, the Air Force started dropping dummies from planes that had latex skin and aluminum bones in order to better understand how pilots might survive high-altitude falls. But the thing was, shiny dummies dropping from the sky after weird wreckage was found in a field just made people think something was amiss. Again, the military didn't help matters by being so secretive. Not only was it dropping these dummies from the sky, it had been working on something called Project Mogul. This was top secret and involved using high-altitude balloons carrying low-frequency sound sensors. The military hoped these sensors, when flown into the tropopods, would be able to record through a sound channel for thousands of miles, thereby enabling the US to spy on the Soviet Union's nuclear program. As you might guess, they were made from futuristic looking material and not something most people had ever seen before. The New York Times said the following about these balloons. It was like having an elephant in your backyard and hoping that no one would notice it. 
According to History.com, what the rancher found in his field was one of these balloons, described as a 700-foot-long string of neoprene balloons, radar reflectors for tracking, and sonic equipment. The problem was that even those working at the Roswell base didn't know about this very top secret project, so even for military men, that strange debris looked alien. Advanced technology to spy on Russia was of course a cat you just couldn't let out of the bag. It didn't help matters when the people that did know about the project made up the feeble weather balloon story, which even to the untrained eye was an obvious lie. We might also add that the military didn't say anything about Project Mogul until the 1990s. Sounds fishy, eh? So that's the official story, but it's a story that has been called by many the biggest alien cover-up the world has ever seen. There are many reasons why this is. Firstly, the military's reputation was at stake, and making up a flimsy story about a weather balloon doesn't really make any sense. Those initial investigators were intelligent men, and to think they would have been mistaken about an object not from this world is perhaps not congruent with their expertise. It would be the same today if military investigators made such a claim and then the big dogs at the Pentagon just told us that the whole thing had been a mistake. The officers actually put themselves, their careers, and their reputations on the line. Saying they had found an alien object was a big deal, and as we know, at least one of those investigators died believing that that's what they had found. So we must take this into account, the fact that serious people who understood military hardware said they'd found part of an alien ship. They had nothing to gain from making the story up, in fact, they had a lot to lose. To strengthen this point, we might look at the nuclear physicist and UFOologist Stanton Terry Friedman. He was one of the main investigators, a supremely intelligent man and not some part-time armchair conspiracy theorist. He eventually left the military and spent the rest of his life studying UFOs. He has testified in front of Congress and written scores of papers explaining the existence of aliens and their machines. He believed that something called the Majestic 12 group of politicians, military people, and scientists had covered up the incident at Roswell, and a document titled Operation Majestic 12 that described the incident in detail was very much real and truthful. Others, including some UFOologists, have called these papers an elaborate hoax. The FBI investigated the case and stated that the Majestic 12 didn't even exist. One of Friedman's most famous quotes is this, The evidence is overwhelming that the Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled vehicles from off the Earth. He's not alone. The man that drafted the original press release about finding a flying disc was named Walter Haught. He wrote a book called The Roswell Incident, and in his later life he swore in an affidavit that he had seen an egg-shaped alien spacecraft, but also that he had seen alien bodies, short dudes with large heads. He said there had been two crash sites, with bodies only at one of them. He had always been reluctant to talk about what he had seen, and it wasn't until 2007 when he stunned people with his explanation. Some people believe this confession to be of great importance, but others are skeptical. Why come out with this so late in the game? Well, some say it might have something to do with the fact that his daughter runs the UFO museum in Roswell, and she might have benefited from his candidness. His words are just that, words. And in spite of fake videos showing us alien bodies, no bodies have ever been photographed or filmed. So, there are no photographs, but it also turned out that many Roswell documents were destroyed by the government. In fact, in 2016, John Podesta had tried to help Hillary Clinton open the case again and find all the original files by invoking the Freedom of Information Act. The files had disappeared, but it was clear there'd been some investigation by the Air Force, said Podesta. However, a story in The Guardian in 2011 noted that the FBI routinely destroyed files because in the 40s and 50s there were so many UFO files that they were taking up too much space. One note that wasn't destroyed was a memo written by Special Agent Guy Hotel, the head of the FBI's Washington field office. He sent it to FBI boss J. Edgar Hoover, and it stated that three flying saucers were found. He also wrote, each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. According to the National UFO Reporting Center, since 2014 there's been quite a drop in the number of people that have reported seeing alien spacecraft. But prior to the 1940s, there's little evidence of people saying they saw unidentified flying objects. Then we got the space race and mind-blowing technologies, and people not only started saying they saw UFOs, but some believed they had been abducted by aliens. This was the dawn of a new era of alien conspiracies, with Roswell perhaps being the best known of them all. When video technology became easily accessible, we also saw many films of strange objects in the sky, and perhaps even the most skeptical amongst us could be swayed toward believing they were watching aliens. 
Let's now try to find out what could be hidden from us in this episode of the Infographic Show. Is the US military hiding aliens? We won't spend too much time on Roswell, because we've done that already in our show Evidence That Aliens Did Come to Roswell. But let us recap at least what went down in the small town in New Mexico. If you looked at the Roswell Daily Record on July 8, 1947, you'd have seen a headline that said the Roswell Army Airfield had captured an alien spacecraft. The US government denied that this happened, and said that in fact pieces of of what looked like to some a UFO was actually a weather balloon. Nonetheless, it was reported by some that the debris consisted of a 700-foot-long string of neoprene balloons, radar reflectors for tracking, and sonic equipment. Was this a cover-up? Well, the USA at the time had been developing advanced military machinery, and there is no doubt at all that many of these developments were top secret. The USA didn't want the Soviet Union knowing what it was working on, so things had to be hush-hush. The weather balloon story just didn't cut it for many, including much of the media. But that didn't mean the USA was hiding aliens. Rather, secret things were happening, and so at times cover-ups took place. You also had respected physicist and ufologist Stanton Terry Friedman saying there was a cover-up, and he really did believe if a UFO had landed in Roswell. He said there was something called the Majestic 12, a group of powerful men that knew all about the existence of aliens. He wrote, the evidence is overwhelming that the Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled vehicles from off of the Earth. The FBI alluded that he was delusional. Maybe you believe that this man and other conspiracy theorists were delusional, but then you might take note that when in 2016 John Podesta wanted to release the Roswell files under the Freedom of Information Act, they were missing. The files had disappeared, but it was clear there had been some investigation by the Air Force, said Podesta. Hmm, sound fishy? Then you have the area in Nevada where the USA develops new technologies, the place known as Area 51. We know black projects happened there, but we don't exactly know what. Again, it's in the interests of a country to keep such things secret, but as long as there is secrecy, there will be paranoia and conspiracies. The alien conspiracy certainly heightened when a man called Bob Lazar appeared on US television in 1989, saying he worked in this area reverse engineering several flying saucers. The question is, was he delusional too? With this in mind, we at least need to investigate further. In 2017, the New York Times reported that the Pentagon was spending $600 billion on defense, but there was a mysterious $22 million spent on the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. That is cash spent on looking for UFOs, and where that money went exactly remains a secret. The Pentagon has admitted that this program existed, but then also said it was closed down in 2012. The shadowy program, parts of it remain classified, began in 2007, and initially it was largely funded at the request of Harry Reid, the Nevada Democrat who was the Senate Majority Leader at the time and who has long had an interest in space phenomena, wrote the Times. The paper added that much of the money in this program came from a billionaire entrepreneur by the name of Robert Bigelow. He has gone on record saying he is absolutely convinced that aliens have been here on Earth. He says the program has indeed included documents that say sightings of UFOs have happened, and those objects moved at very high speeds and showed no signs of propulsion. The program also included information about the mysterious oval object that in 2004, was being chased by two Navy F-A-18F fighter jets. Scientists, however, told the Times that one should not rush to the conclusion that every strange moving object is an alien spacecraft. Rather, sometimes natural phenomenon can look like a UFO. We are also told that flying objects might not always want to be seen, and sometimes they are not aliens but flown by humans. In the 1950s and 60s, the USA had something called Project Blue Book. That project told us thousands of objects were seen flying through the sky, but often those were other countries' spy planes, clouds, or just conventional aircraft. We are also told that 701 of these objects, in that project at least, were never properly explained. So we know that the US has a certain amount of black money and that the cash is spent on seeing or understanding alien technology. This is a fact and no one is denying it. Space.com talks about the secret project too, telling us that a man who ran the program for a while went on record saying, there is very compelling evidence that we may not be alone. This is not some conspiracy theorist, this is a man that worked at the higher echelons of US intelligence. He told CNN that some of the aircraft being studied in the program were displaying characteristics that are not currently within the US inventory, nor in any foreign inventory that we are aware of. Some reports say when he left his job in 2016, he did so because he was annoyed that the government wasn't taking aliens or the threat of aliens seriously enough. 
Then we have the Mutual UFO Network, and the people working there believe we are on the brink of something big regarding UFOs. This group of people are at the forefront of UFO research and have studied over 100,000 UFO reports over the last 50 years or so. Their conclusion is without a doubt UFOs have been seen, that the technology is fantastic, and that we can learn a lot from those technologies. Our military vaults are full of such videos and data on these objects. Now that the spill gates have been opened a little, it's time for the rest to come out in an orderly fashion," said the network. But there are still skeptics. One writer told Space.com that while we might come across alien spacecraft, the $22 million the USA spent was not much in the bigger scheme of things. He believes there are a few curious minds in the government, but that's it. Nothing is being hidden from us. All you have are a few UFO believers in and outside the government who were able to get away with funneling a few million Pentagon dollars to themselves for UFO research and have very little to show for it," he said. What we have perhaps as the best case for a UFO is that amazing footage of the US fighter jets following some kind of object. It seems that many experts say that this is some of the most compelling evidence. After that, we have the Times report, which was in some ways groundbreaking because it proved the US government was looking for aliens. The Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program was about the nearest thing we have to the X-Files, or at least is the nearest thing we've been told about. What do the Brits think about this? In 2017, The Guardian reported the same story as everyone else, that the US was looking for aliens and wasn't denying it. But the British government in 2010 also released its own UFO report. We're told that this consisted of around 6,000 pages of documentation, but nothing in there proved the existence of UFOs. British UFO expert Nick Pope read all these documents and said, there's a great deal of mundane correspondence between the MOD and the public, together with the vast number of UFO sightings which are clearly aircraft lights satellites or meteors. But there is some more interesting material. Indeed, some of the events he mentioned have remained something of a mystery. He said that it's now time that everyone realize that both the UK and US governments are taking aliens seriously, maybe more seriously than ever. Like our US colleagues, we too denied, even to Parliament, that we were undertaking secret studies into the UFO phenomenon and consistently downplayed the true extent of our interest and activity at the Ministry of Defense, he said. That said, the British MOD closed down its UFO hotline in 2009, stating that no sighting over the years had led to anything substantial. The American Department of Defense said it closed its program to use the funding for other projects. It did say this, though, to the media in 2017. The DoD takes seriously all threats and potential threats to our people, our assets, and our mission, and takes action whenever credible information is developed. Unfortunately, boys and girls and alien enthusiasts, besides the USA admitting that there is black money and black sites we don't have much to go on, we have some interesting videos and we have very few supposed whistleblowers who might also be crackpots. We had a cover-up in Roswell, but it wasn't a cover-up of alien existence. It was just more secrecy from an already paranoid government. What we at the Infographics Show think is that the US government isn't necessarily hiding information pertaining to the existence of UFOs, but it does work under the veil of secrecy. That's it. That's all, folks. There's no big conspiracy to keep us unaware of the truth. Life on Earth Scientists have been studying it for centuries, creating a timeline from when the first single-cell beings emerged in primordial waters to today, when billions of humans populate the surface. But there's one question they've never been able to answer with 100% certainty. How exactly did it begin? Most scientists think it started from a complex chemical reaction in the water of the early Earth. Some argue for a more intelligent hand guiding the process. The only thing that's sure is that no one's sure, and everyone has an opinion. But what if the origin of life on Earth didn't actually come from Earth? Could life on Earth be the product of extraterrestrials? So far, we don't have any conclusive proof for or against life outside of Earth. No contact has been made and no DNA or fossils from other life forms have been discovered. But we've only explored a tiny fragment of the universe out there, almost none of it in person. And the odds that countless planets surrounding countless stars would have no other planets capable of supporting life since the Big Bang is pretty slim. And after billions of years of this universe existing, many of those worlds may not exist anymore. Asteroids, comets, and other interstellar phenomena can immediately bring a crushing end to any world's life forms, as the dinosaurs found out the hard way. But what if the life from those worlds didn't stay on those worlds? The hypothesis is panspermia, which claims that not only does life exist throughout the universe, but that it gets carried from world to world by traveling objects like asteroids and comets, the space dust that gets attached to anything traveling through space, even the spaceships that humans send to explore the moon and nearby planets, 
may have microscopic forms of life in them that travel to other worlds and seed them when they land, creating the building blocks of future life on those worlds. But could anything survive in the cold vacuum of space? Well, we couldn't, and neither could most animals on Earth. But when you look at smaller animals, some survive climates that could kill humans in seconds. The Pompeii worm lives in deep hydrothermal vents that can reach up to 175 degrees Fahrenheit. The flatbark beetle, which lives in some of the coldest climates in North America, produces natural antifreeze chemicals that help it survive in the winter and enter a sort of stasis, smoothly surviving the coldest parts of the winter while we're fighting over the thermostat. Neither of them could survive in space. But that's not the case for one microscopic creature. The name water bear probably creates cute images of an ursine mammal enjoying a bath in the river. But the real thing is much less cuddly, and also less likely to eat you. Also called a tardigrade, this tiny organism is the only form of life that seems to be able to live anywhere, even in the most extreme conditions. They've been found everywhere from deserts to hot springs and they may even potentially exist in space thanks to a crash of a sample from a spaceship on the moon. These tiny multi-legged creatures can dry up and fall into a state that resembles death, but when exposed to water even decades later they spring back to life. So if life originated from outside Earth, how exactly did it get here? There are a couple of theories of exactly how these building blocks of life arrived on our ancient planet, most of them based around interstellar physics. One theory from a Swedish scientist in 1903 theorizes that the radiation pressure from stars can send particles through space, but this would only work for the smallest particles, and many if not all would be killed off by the radiation. But it's possible that alien bacteria or viruses could survive if shielded from UV radiation. The other main theory is that the particles that led to the creation of life were hitchhikers on rocks, coming into contact with Earth when the rocks crash landed here. While we know how asteroids, comets, and meteors travel through the galaxy, this is under far more extreme conditions than any life form has been known to survive, surviving in the vacuum of space for years on end before crash landing. But there is another theory, that the alien life forms didn't come here accidentally. What if the alien life out there was intelligent and advanced enough that they could have sent the building blocks of life toward Earth deliberately? The first possibility of this is accidental transport. On Earth, there have been countless cases of people throwing trash into the water and having it swept somewhere completely different, often endangering animal life in the process. It's possible that an alien civilization would have been advanced enough to send waste products into space and dump them on an uninhabited world that, thanks to the trace DNA on the waste, evolved into Earth as we know today. But other theories say that seeding of Earth might be much more deliberate. Directed panspermia is the idea that alien species created life on Earth via transport of organisms from their world. The idea of a deliberate seeding of this planet sidesteps a lot of the issues with the other theories, because the aliens would have been able to shield the samples for their trip, eliminating the threat that the journey through space or the cosmic radiation would kill off the organisms before they ever reach their target. The alien species, if advanced enough to send samples into space, would be able to send them at high speeds that would allow them to reach their destination in a more feasible time. So why would aliens want to seed our planet? The first possible theory is that the aliens were looking to secure and protect life in space by spreading it among a larger area. Even the strongest civilization could be felled by a natural disaster or a stray comet. And when life exists on more than one world, it's insured against the whims of the cosmos. Of course, that was three and a half billion years ago, and the odds are good that any alien civilization that seeded Earth at the dawn of our world would be long gone themselves by now. But what if they weren't? There have been many theories about aliens making contact with Earth, but thus far no conclusive proof has been found, regardless of how many people say they were abducted by a flying saucer. But if aliens are out there and may even have ties to the creation of life on Earth, then why haven't they made contact yet? One theory is that they simply don't want to. They're more than happy just to watch. This is called the zoo hypothesis, and it states that we're all essentially living in a giant terrarium. Whatever these aliens are, they have technology far beyond ours and they're perfectly happy watching us as our still primitive planet slowly evolves. If we don't know about their existence, it's because they don't want us to know. Yet. So are there any problems with this idea? Just one big one. Have you ever tried to get a group of people to agree on anything? Trying to get 10 people to agree on one place to eat is hard enough. Imagine how difficult it'd be to get an entire civilization to agree to keep a secret forever without any of them breaking the code of silence and broadcasting their existence to our human zoo. It would have had to last millions of years of humans and their ancestors existing, and likely countless generations of the aliens not breaking their own protocol. That's why many people say the zoo hypothesis resembles creationism and religious theory more than panspermia. But have the aliens truly maintained a hands-off approach all this time? 
A popular idea, but maybe not so popular among scientists, is that Earth has been visited repeatedly by advanced alien civilizations that may have interacted with humans before recorded history, called the Ancient Astronauts Theory. It often has ties to various religions, after all. How many religious texts refer to powerful and mysterious beings descending from the heavens and performing miracles? But is there any evidence of these interstellar visits? If you watch a program called Ancient Aliens, a lot. This popular documentary style series looks at evidence of alien interactions with humans with a particular focus on early civilizations and the idea that certain technology and buildings couldn't have been constructed by pre-industrial humans alone. They look at mythology of giants and gods, massive structures like the pyramids that show up across the world, and technology that seems too advanced for the time, like the massive clockwork Antikythera mechanism of ancient Greece. With 16 seasons and almost 200 episodes, there are a lot of believers, but just as many detractors. The ancient astronauts theory, and ancient aliens in particular, has been criticized for using selective evidence and disregarding the contributions of early native cultures. The construction methods for megalithic structures like Stonehenge, the Great Pyramids of Egypt, and the Mayan pyramids have been investigated and largely proven. While there's still a lot of mysteries surrounding ancient architecture like the giant stone spheres of Costa Rica, few of them seem to point to aliens, but that hasn't stopped the speculation from growing. We don't know for sure if aliens have visited Earth, but there's a chance that their DNA is still with us. We might be all descended from aliens if their organisms seeded our world eons ago. The most likely scenario if we evolved from alien microorganisms is that we're so radically different from the original species by now that there'd be no similarity anymore. If an alien species did seed Earth deliberately, then the odds are it didn't seed Earth with the most advanced form of life on its planet, but one of the smallest and easiest to transport. The continuum of life on Earth indicates that life likely started with microorganisms swimming in the water before turning into larger forms of life and eventually heading onto land, a far cry from the aliens who might have organized Earth's seeding. But could humanity's ties to alien DNA be a lot more recent? Many proponents of the ancient astronauts' theory suggest that the aliens may have continued to visit Earth up until the early days of humanity and may have actually bred with humans, leaving traces of their DNA in ours. While the idea of aliens on a pleasure cruise looking for some exotic party times might be relatable, especially if they have common DNA with those party kids who hit Cancun every spring break, there are a lot of holes in the theory. The aliens would have to still be around and in a similar shape billions of years after Earth was first seeded, and they'd have to be genetically compatible with humans despite those billions of years of evolution. So no, it's not very likely that your great 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 grandpa was an alien. But that doesn't mean this kind of interbreeding between humans and their distant relatives isn't possible. Recent studies indicate that human fossils have traces of DNA from ancient humans that preceded Homo sapiens. The more famous Neanderthals are in there, but so are an extinct species of archaic humans we know relatively little about. The Denisovans, only identified in 2010 in Siberia, they have been identified from a few bones and teeth that are distinct from other species. When ancient genomes were sequenced for the first time, scientists found fragments of genetic code that didn't match up with Homo sapiens. Neanderthals were quickly identified, in fact, it's estimated that most humans besides Africans have up to 4% of trace Neanderthal DNA in their genome. No one knows exactly what population of ancient humans may be lurking in the recesses of the human genome, both ancient and modern. What we do know is that modern humans are a complex mix of influences that made us what we are. Could one of those influences be from beyond our solar system? We don't have proof of that yet. But the human genome is a mystery and we don't have proof that it's impossible either. One question we always ask ourselves from time to time, are we alone in the universe? Many of us would like to believe that there's more out there than just us, and looking up at the stars and planets, it's hard not to think about the possibility of life beyond Earth. It seems like something out of science fiction, but there's some pretty convincing evidence out there. And that's what this video is all about. It's 50 crazy facts about aliens that will convince you they exist. So get ready for an out of this world video that might just turn you from a skeptic to a believer. Number 50. There's a scientific organization dedicated to looking for them. Carl Sagan and Jill Tarter, two well-known astronomers, founded the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, or SETI, to explore, understand, and explain the origin and nature of life in the universe and the evolution of intelligence. Number 49. There are thousands of other planets outside our solar system. NASA has confirmed that the number of exoplanets, or planets that revolve around a different star as opposed to our Sun, is over 4,000. That's a lot of planets that could be home to alien life. Number 48. 
a famous asteroid may be debris from an alien structure. Avi Lloyd, a former Harvard astronomy professor, theorized that the famous asteroid Oumuamua is actually a piece of debris from an alien structure or even an alien spacecraft. Number 47. People have been seeing UFOs in America since the 1600s. The first UFO sighting in American history was recorded by John Winthrop in 1639, who wrote in his diary about a sighting of strange green light that ran as swift as an arrow and transported a boat full of Puritans a mile upstream. Number 46. There was an Air Force UFO investigation operation called Project Blue Book, started after a pilot reported nine strange flying objects in 1947. Project Blue Book compiled reports on more than 12,000 UFO sightings from 1952 to 1969, after which it was dissolved. Number 45. UFOs don't have to look like flying saucers. A UFO account by pilot Kenneth Arnold described a UFO as moving like a saucer if you skip it across the water, leading to the image of a UFO as having a saucer-like shape. Number 44. There are over 17,000 nearby stars likely to have planets that could support complex life. The list was compiled by astronomers Margaret Turnbill and Jill Tarter of the Carnegie Institution in Washington, D.C. Number 43. We may come across an alien radio signal by 2025. Seth Shostak, senior astronomer at SETI, believes the Allen Telescope Array, which is currently being built, will come across an alien signal by that year. Number 42. There could be alien life hiding in our own solar system. The most likely places for it to be found are underground refuges on Mars, hotspots on Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, or beneath the mysterious ice crusts of Jupiter's moons, Europa and Callisto. Number 41. We made TV for aliens. On September 30, 2006, the French Center for National Space Studies sent Cosmic Connection, their alien-targeted TV program, toward a star 45 light-years away. If there are aliens there, the signal should reach them by 2051. Number 40. We used to think there weren't any planets outside our solar system. 30 years ago, we hadn't discovered one planet outside of the solar system we call home. Now we've learned about more than 3,000. Number 39. Scientists estimate that one in every five or six planets resides in the Goldilocks zone, which means it's just the right temperature for water to form on the surface in liquid form. Where there is water, there can be life. Number 38. Earth is getting radio signals we can't explain. FRBs, or fast radio bursts, have been detected since 2007. We don't know much about them except that they are coming from outside the Milky Way galaxy. Some experts think they might be an advanced civilization trying to speak to us or they are just sending us the latest alien pop hits. Number 37. Paul Hellyer, Canada's former defense minister, is a believer. According to Hellyer, at least 80 different species of aliens have visited Earth over the last several thousand years. Number 36. Some people believe that aliens have played a role in humanity's development during these several thousand years. A number of alien addicts buy into the controversial ancient aliens theory, which posits that aliens could have influenced a number of cultures, including the ancient Egyptians. Number 35. Even celebrities have UFO sightings. Oscar-winning director Guillermo del Toro spotted a UFO in Guadalajara, which he described as a flying saucer so cliched with lights. Number 34. Britain's first astronaut says they exist. No one knows space better than an astronaut, and Helen Sharman, the first British citizen in space, told the observer aliens exist, there's no two ways about it. Number 33. There is a UFO in a 15th century painting. The Madonna with Saint Giovannino might depict the Virgin Mary in the foreground, but behind her, a strange shape can be seen that looks suspiciously like a flying saucer. Number 32. A 9th century Latin manuscript may directly reference aliens. In it, the Archbishop of Lyons described a story about a region from whence come ships in the clouds, occupied by sailors. There were even three men and a woman who claimed to have fallen from these sky ships, but they were stoned to death for their story. Number 31. The US Navy has confirmed the existence of UFOs. When describing three clips of declassified military footage that became public between 2017 and 2018, the Navy referred to them as unidentified aerial phenomena. Number 30. The most famous American UFO sighting of all time occurred in Roswell, New Mexico in 1947 when a strange object was seen falling from the sky. The Army first described the object as a flying disc, but later claimed it was from a weather balloon. Witnesses supposedly saw the military take away a flying disc and alien bodies. Number 29. A UFO interfered at a US nuclear base. 
In 1967, the missiles at a Montana base became mysteriously unlaunchable, while a large red glowing object floated above the facility. Perhaps those aliens were pacifists. Number 28. Extremophiles prove that life can exist under harsh conditions. Some creatures on Earth, like tardigrades that can withstand temperatures from 0 degrees to over 100 degrees Celsius, can go without food for 10 years, can live through just about anything. And if these creatures can do it, what's to stop similar creatures from thriving on seemingly inhospitable planets? Number 27. On August 15, 1977, the Big Ear Radio Telescope at Ohio State University picked up a radio signal that lasted for 72 seconds, came from almost 220 light years away, and has never been found again. It was so impressive that the observing scientists wrote WOW on the computer printout of the signal. Number 26. On September 12, 1952, seven residents of Braxton County in West Virginia claimed to see a 10-foot-tall alien in the hills above Flatwoods. These sightings followed the appearance of a red light in the sky that appeared to fall and crash on a local farm. The apparent alien became a local legend known as the Flatwoods Monster. Skeptics believe the creature may have been the glowing eyes of a barn owl, but a number of witnesses stick to their story. Number 25. There are subsurface oceans of water beneath several moons in our solar system and throughout the universe, and these might be the perfect place for alien life to thrive. These hidden oceans are excellent for developing life, but also make it difficult for us to detect. Number 24. A number of people who reported alien sightings also reported run-ins with the so-called Men in Black, who, far from their charming Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones movie counterparts, often apparently behave a lot like creepy aliens themselves. Number 23. Betty and Barney Hill were a couple that claimed to be abducted by aliens in 1961. They recovered memories of this encounter through regressive hypnosis. While many were skeptical, Betty was able to draw a map of the alien's supposed constellation from memory. Scientists noted that the drawing resembled the actual constellation of Zeta Reticuli. Number 22. In 1957, a Brazilian farmer claimed to have been abducted by aliens, probed, and bred. Doctors later confirmed that the farmer had suffered radiation poisoning, which could not be explained. Number 21. This year, the Pentagon released three videos of UFOs recorded by the Navy, one from 2004 and two from 2015. The three videos depict objects moving through the sky in strange ways that cannot be explained, as the pilots filming them react with confusion and excitement. Number 20. China has developed a new fixed 100-meter aperture spherical radio telescope, or FAST, that can be used to search for extraterrestrial signals. If all goes according to plan, this could potentially make China the first country to make contact with an alien civilization. Number 19. Tom DeLonge, a former member of American rock band Blink-182, now spends a lot of his time being a professional UFOologist with his organization, the To The Stars Academy. He's also apparently a big believer in Bigfoot. Number 18. Former President Jimmy Carter once saw a UFO. On September 18, 1973, he filed a report with the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, describing his sighting. The object was very bright with changing colors and about the size of the moon. Number 17. During World War II, Air Force pilots on overnight missions encountered colorful lights that would chase the aircraft. These lights could move up to 200 miles per hour and flew circles around the pilots. The pilots nicknamed these alien lights Foo Fighters. Number 16. In 1997, thousands of people in Arizona claimed to see strange lights fly across the sky in a V-shape. These were nicknamed the Phoenix Lights. Number 15. A logger named Travis Walton disappeared for five days in 1975 after a glowing disc zapped him with what was described as a bluish ray. He was found on the roadside with stories of aliens that looked like well-developed fetuses in tan robes. Number 14. In February of 1942, the Army attacked a glowing object near Culver City, assuming it was an air raid. However, even after the object disappeared, no pieces of it were ever found. Many suspected that an alien craft was responsible. Number 13. Some scientists attribute the effects of supposed alien abductions to sleep paralysis, a condition that causes an inability to move when one's mind is trapped in a temporary sort of walking nightmare. However, others argue that sleep paralysis does not explain away all the effects of abductions. Number 12. Famous physicist Stephen Hawking advised against contacting alien life, saying, If aliens ever visit us, I think the outcome would be much as when Christopher Columbus landed in America. Number 11. There is supposedly a document known as Project Grudge Report 13 that details the investigation into a supposed alien abduction of an American Air Force sergeant. However, despite testimonies from a former Green Beret captain and various conspiracy theorists, 
there is no official information on Report 13 available. Number 10. In 2019, in Colorado, five bulls showed up dead, drained of blood, and with body parts cleanly removed. Many attributed this, as with other accounts of unexplained cattle mutilation, to the actions of aliens. Number 9. Fran Drescher, the former star of The Nanny, believes that both she and her ex-husband were abducted by aliens before they met. The two have matching scars, which Drescher attributes to experiments done on them during their abduction. Number 8. The first crop circles appeared in the English countryside in the 1970s. Over the years, many have associated crop circles with alien activity, though others insist that they're man-made hoaxes. Number 7. The term Little Green Men as a depiction for aliens originated from an encounter in Hopkinsville, Kentucky in 1955. The Sutton family witnessed a UFO landing and claimed to be attacked by a group of strange humanoid creatures with metallic skin. They were described as little men and that later turned into little green men. Number 6. SETI uses deep sea exploration to practice for deep space exploration. They use robots to explore deep sea vents in preparation for similar climates that might appear in alien oceans on other planets, allowing us to prepare to get closer to an environment that might house alien life. Number 5. In 1987, a man named Ed Walters claimed to be contacted by aliens who physically lifted him off the ground with a beam of light from one of their ships. He took many photos of the supposed ships, which are still a source of great debate to this day. Number 4. A horror writer named Whitley Strieber claimed to be abducted by aliens from his cabin on December 26, 1985. He wrote a book about his encounter, which was made into a film starring Christopher Walken. Number 3. In December of 1980, several witnesses claimed to see mysterious lights over Rendlesham Forest in Suffolk, England. One of the witnesses was a United States Air Force Deputy Base Commander who wrote about the sighting in an affidavit issued in 2010, where he described these lights as an extraterrestrial in origin. Number 2. Most UFO abductees describe the same kind of alien, humanoid, bald, with large eyes and gray skin. This description is so common that this type of alien has become colloquially known as the Greys. Number 1. There's a support group based in New England for people who have had encounters with aliens. As of 2009, the group has had over 1,500 members, each with their own story of an alien encounter or abduction. The specific details of the group are kept secret for the privacy and safety of its members. Are we alone in the universe? There's no way to know, yet. But humanity isn't taking any chances. In 1977, the Voyager spacecrafts carried two golden records into space, each containing sounds and images designed to explain life on Earth. The idea is that aliens will find them, have the proper technology to play a 1977 record, and then learn about our little planet. Maybe they'll pay us a visit. What could go wrong? Well, it turns out, a lot. The idea of making contact with aliens has been a fixation for us since the beginning of the space age, and most scenarios begin the same way. An alien spaceship lands and out come some little green or gray men, and they say, take us to your leader, and they get to meet the president. Okay, so now what? Well, if you ask the hopeful people who can't wait for aliens to visit us, they'll tell you that only good things are coming. Aliens will probably bring technology far beyond ours, and they'll be excited to share it with us. Maybe we'll get the technology they use to clone bodies and conquer death. Maybe they'll take us on a tour of the cosmos at light speed. Maybe we'll even get those flying cars they promised us in the Jetsons. And all thanks to our new high-tech friends from the stars. No wonder everyone was so excited about them paying us a visit. But the reality might be very different. Scientists are the ones responsible for reaching out into space and finding evidence of life, but if you talk to many of them, they're the ones most nervous about finding out if there actually is someone else out there watching. And when scientists are concerned, we should probably listen, right? While they are continuing the efforts to unmask the hidden faces in the galaxies far beyond ours, many also privately say that the odds are, if we do succeed, the result could be a very harsh awakening about our place in the universe. Because we may not be the top dogs anymore. Humanity has dominated Earth as the only sapient species for over a million years, and we really don't have any competitors. The only real threat to us seems to be ourselves. But in terms of space travel, we can still only cover a very small area. Humanity has gotten to the moon, sent complex unmanned probes to Mars, and conducted surveillance missions in the Milky Way. Some of the furthest reaching probes we've sent are one-way missions, and we're pretty confident at this point that there isn't any other intelligent life in the solar system that we're close to discovering. While it's possible that life could exist or previously has existed on Mars or some of the large moons of the gas giants like Titan or Io, most of the landscapes in our solar system are deeply inhospitable to the development of life. Which means any life that comes looking for us would come from much further. 
And that means that any alien species that makes contact with us would likely be much more advanced than us, and we'd be dependent on their goodwill once they arrive. The best case scenario is that the aliens who find us would be fellow scientists looking to learn about our culture and then leave. We likely wouldn't have much to offer them, but hopefully they would be followers of the famous Star Trek concept of the Prime Directive, which is that advanced species in the Starfleet should not interfere with the development of more primitive cultures. But even that has its risks. Imagine if an alien spaceship shows up on Earth, scans us for information, and then leaves because it didn't think we were worth talking to. Way to cause global psychological breakdown, aliens. But most scenarios paint a much bleaker picture. The take us to your leader aliens are one kind of visitors from the stars, but another is much less friendly. How many movies have begun with aliens landing and immediately attacking Earth? What do they want exactly? Humans to take upstairs for probing? Maybe it's a hunting expedition for an alien bachelor party. No matter the cause for an alien invasion, the harsh fact is that humanity would have very little chance to defend itself against an alien invasion because their technology would be incredibly advanced compared to ours. You can call in the team from Top Gun to scramble the fighter jets, but the odds are that any spaceship that could travel across multiple galaxies to find us would be able to handle any technology we have. But what if the aliens aren't even here for us? One of the most iconic depictions of an alien invasion in film history is the 1996 movie Independence Day, which saw countless disc-like alien ships descend to Earth without a word and attack, blowing up major cities and shooting lasers into massive holes they created in Earth's crust. Humanity did wind up winning, partially thanks to a pilot sacrificing himself and flying directly into the mothership, but the scariest thing wasn't the scope of the invasion, it was the reasoning. The aliens didn't care about humanity, they simply wanted to mine the planet for its resources and then leave a destroyed husk in its place. They didn't care about the small, primitive animals living on the surface, and if an advanced alien species just decided they wanted to use humanity for resources, there would likely be very little we could do to resist. Good thing there's no history of humanity doing that, right? Maybe the biggest threat of an alien invasion is that humanity would wind up being the latest victim of alien colonialism. The same brutal story from human history would play out once again. A society is largely keeping to itself when suddenly ships appear on the horizon. The colonists say they're here to civilize the tribe and take it over in the name of some glorious far-flung empire. In the best case scenario, the tribe loses its independence and many of its traditions. There might be forced assimilation, the taking of children to be educated in the colonizer's system, and the imposition of a new government. And that's the best case scenario. Many colonizers viewed the people they colonized as less than human. They would enslave them and force them to work their own land for resources to be taken back to the colonial power. If they resisted, they would be brutally killed. And many colonizers committed outright genocides on the indigenous people. So one of the biggest risks of alien contact is that the aliens wouldn't view us as their equals at all, but as their new property. But the danger to the natives during colonization wasn't just in terms of the occupier's actions. In many cases, the population was decimated not by murder, but by disease. The natives lived in their own ecosystem, and the colonizers brought their own diseases from the homeland. The immune system of the natives was unprepared, and many were wiped out by diseases including smallpox and cholera. This was weaponized by cruel colonists at times, but most of the deaths were the result of accidental exposure. The good news is medical science has advanced a lot since then, and the introduction of new alien diseases would be studied by scientists who might be able to cure them in short order, but only if they followed the rules we know. Novel viruses do pop up regularly, but they're usually closely related to another virus that already exists. When COVID-19 popped up and devastated the world in 2020, scientists who were working to develop a vaccine for past coronaviruses, including the common cold, jumped into action, and they were able to create working vaccines in less than a year. But without that base of knowledge, trying to decipher an alien virus would be like trying to crack a cipher in a completely new language. And that's assuming that it doesn't just wipe out humanity in a hurry because our immune systems are uniquely vulnerable from the first handshake. And that's not the only bad scenario that includes disease. Assuming that we are the less advanced species in the equation, it makes sense that we'd be the most vulnerable to the disease. But that might not always be the case. A more advanced species might also be a more sterile one, and it's possible that the aliens may not be able to handle disease. Thus, the scenario could be flipped. Peaceful aliens make first contact, shake hands, and come down with all our diseases. Suddenly, we have a dead alien delegation on our hands. In the best case scenario, it's a massive missed opportunity that may never be recovered. In the worst case scenario, we now have an angry second delegation wearing biohazard suits coming to sterilize the planet. And that's not the only way an alien organism could affect the planet. Alright, so let's go for a slightly less intense first contact scenario. Say, humanity manages to land on the moon of Io, get under the atmosphere, and they discover a strange creature living there. 
It's about the size of a rabbit made out of what looks like black stone. It's kind of cute. The mission brings one back to Earth to study it, and then it turns out that that creature reproduces asexually and lives off the oxygen in Io's atmosphere that is mostly made up of sulfur dioxide. Exposed to Earth's atmosphere filled with oxygen, it starts reproducing exponentially, consuming the resources we need to live. It's like the trouble with Tribbles as an apocalyptic event. Is this an unlikely series of events? Sure, but given how little we know about the possibility of life outside of Earth, it's impossible to rule anything out. We are staring into the unknown, and scientists say that it should scare us. Scientists like nuclear physicist Enrico Fermi have looked at the possibility of contact with another species and observed that it seems like if they were out there, they probably should have contacted us by now. The explanation for why they haven't is that the scenarios where intelligent life can develop are exceedingly rare, and with the universe being over 13 billion years old and human life existing for only around 2 million years, the pockets of time in which we could make contact are few and easy to miss. Any first contact would be extremely risky and likely involve contact between two planets at drastically different stages of their development. It's entirely possible that a hundred million years ago, some enterprising aliens discovered Earth, came to visit, and got eaten by massive reptiles. Their home world marked a do not visit sign on Earth and haven't been back since. But surely it's not all bad news, right? Well, let's say everything goes right, and our space program advances to the point where we can explore more outside of our galaxy, and we make contact with another species from a neighboring galaxy. They're similarly advanced, maybe a century or so in terms of progress beyond us, including having a universal translator that makes communication possible. We're able to make first contact in neutral space and bring the knowledge we've gained back to Earth to figure out what to do next. Now, we have to deal with the biggest problem of making alien first contact, having to deal with humanity itself. The sad fact is, humans can't agree on anything, and that's likely to continue here. While humans have been fascinated with the concept of alien first contact for a long time, they're not exactly prepared to do it, and the discovery would be one of the biggest moments in human history. So what could go wrong? Try just about everything imaginable. Humanity has had some test runs for alien landings, and generally the response is complete chaos and an over-eagerness for violence. You just have to look back at what happened in Flatwoods, West Virginia in 1952. It was September 12th when two brothers and their friends saw something streak through the sky that seemed to land on a plot of a nearby farmer. They went and told a local woman who accompanied the three boys alongside a local National Guardsman and two children they let tag along with them. When they reached the top of the hill, the group claims to have seen a tall figure with a round red face surrounded by what looked like a massive hood. While this is now believed to have been a barn owl perching on a dead tree, it caused a panic in the town that created a decades-long mystery and no shortage of people ready to confront a space alien without a moment's hesitation. And that reveals another potential problem with first contact. Who gets to do the contact? Assuming we're not being invaded, we still know essentially nothing about alien cultures. We have no way of knowing what their culture is like. A handshake, the most famous human greeting, might be an unpardonable insult in alien culture because they consider the hands to be the most unclean part of the body. The only way to find out is trial and error, and then we have to hope that they are a particularly reasonable species. Odds are, those first few days after the first contact might be some of the most tense in human history but it is nothing compared to what would be going on back at Earth. The odds are that everyone would want a piece of the aliens, figuratively and in some cases literally. World governments would be competing to get the first face-to-face -face meeting with the alien leader, no doubt explaining to them who the good guys are and the bad guys are on Earth. The edge would go to whoever's space program discovered the aliens, but the opportunity is so big that no one should be surprised if it turns into a shooting war to be first in line, and that means that the alien delegation could be caught in the middle. But what if it's not a government at all? The process of space exploration has been increasingly privatized, especially in the United States. Struggles back home and a lack of progress in making big leaps has led to many countries to cut funding for their space programs, and into the breach stepped billionaires Elon Musk, Richard Branson, and Jeff Bezos. They focused so far on heading to Mars and sending unmanned spacecraft into deep space, but if they made contact with an alien species first, it would put the governments of the world into a sticky situation. While Musk does partner with NASA on many of his space projects, there's no guarantee that the messages would sync up when it comes time to make contact. 
and that's to say nothing of the chaos in other areas. No one would be shaken more by alien contact than the religious of the world. Most have a doctrine that humanity was created in God's image, and most either quietly or loudly believe that we're the only intelligent life in the universe. The discovery of another intelligent species would result in a crisis of faith not seen before in human history. Some religions might change up their doctrine to account for it, others might see people leave the faith as it no longer makes sense to them, yet others might preach that the aliens are agents of the devil and should be opposed at any cost, potentially putting the alien delegation in danger when they arrive. And yet another group might try to convert the aliens to their faith. Don't worry, the human escorts will likely just tell them to ignore the pamphlets. But religious fervor isn't the only kind of fervor they might encounter. What's one of the most dramatic issues of the modern day? Immigration. Not only are many countries concerned with keeping their border secure, but many people don't even like the idea of immigrants coming in legally. There have been calls for reducing the number of visas given for work and visitation, as well as some demanding to eliminate birthright citizenship that grants citizenship to any child born in the country to a foreign parent. And that's just other humans. So what happens when the sky parts and aliens make clear that even our atmospheric border might be open to new visitors? While most people would likely respond with curiosity, a good number will respond with fear and even anger. Is there even a way to secure ourselves from a visit or an invasion like that? Do we hear someone chanting, build an atmospheric wall and make the aliens pay for it? But those are all extremists, and at least the government should have things in order, right? Well, the governments of Earth have been planning for an alien first contact for a while, and while they're not always in sync, there is an international plan to follow. But that doesn't mean things will go smoothly. For one thing, any alien visitor will be bringing with them technology that would be far beyond anything we've seen, and the temptation will be high for governments to try to get their hands on it and then weaponize it. There have been persistent rumors that the government already has some alien technology thanks to supposed UFO crashes in the post-World War II years. While there's no proof that Area 51 is actually alien-related, it's likely that an alien visit would kick off a massive intelligence race to get the details of their ships and other technology. This could not only increase tensions between the nation here on Earth, but could get all of Earth in hot water if the aliens discover a spy. Okay, let's say we sidestep all those problems. Now what? Once humanity makes first contact with aliens, the focus will likely turn to what they can do for us. If humanity can gain their trust, we'll likely want to know about their medical system, their technology, and anything else that might enhance human life on Earth. The aliens may be willing to share this, but odds are they'll be a lot more hesitant to let us in on the details of their home world. And there's a very good reason for that. Humans visiting new worlds for the first time rarely results in anything good. We've talked about aliens colonizing us, but what happens if we're the colonists? The thing is, Earth isn't doing so great. We've got climate change, we've got diseases, and we've got a lot of humans who don't always have somewhere to live. So many people have been looking for a place to expand to. The most popular opportunity is Mars colonies, where humans would live in bunkers and only be able to exit wearing spacesuits. So the presence of a planet with potentially breathable atmosphere, inhabited by a species we've already befriended, is very tempting as a potential new home. So would history repeat itself? The difference between the colonialism of the past and this one would be that the aliens likely would be far better armed than the humans. Most native societies did have robust self-defenses, and many took the colonists by surprise with how fiercely they fought for their independence. But few societies could ultimately resist the superior navies and the resources of the crown, especially combined with the impact of disease wrecking the society. Attempting to colonize an alien planet would have a much higher likelihood of the humans being routed quickly. But if we took a peaceful alien society by surprise, they could soon find themselves as a colony of Earth. And that would raise a lot of questions about expansion. The human instinct to expand has always been with us, with explorations for new societies having been part of cultures for thousands of years. But that rarely ends in a shaking of hands and trading of wisdom. More often than not, it ends with two societies trading their best shots and one eventually coming to an end. Would that happen again if we made first contact with aliens? There are many scenarios where first contact is the worst thing to happen to humans, to aliens, or in some cases, both. Well, this is depressing, but what is the best case scenario for first contact? It's probably one where humanity's worst instincts are kept in check and the aliens are inherently benevolent. If governments are restrained enough to not run over each other to be the first to meet the aliens, and religion and politics stay out of it, the most likely scenario is that humans are fascinated with aliens. After all, this is the biggest discovery in human history, proof of a society out in the cosmos that has taken many of the same evolutionary steps as us, but followed a very different path. And what's the first thing we probably do in that case? Well, put them on TV, of course! 
Ironically, the saving grace of the aliens who make first contact might be that capitalism has a very big vested interest in keeping them safe. As soon as they step out of the spaceship, the aliens will be the biggest celebrities in the world. And while governments and religions are concerned with what this means for the future, Hollywood will want to get the most out of them now. The reporter who gets the first interview with an alien representative will become a historical icon, and how long before an enterprising producer decides to try to cast the first alien on Dancing with the Stars? But with increased visibility comes increased risk. Alien discourse has been filled with conspiracy theories for decades already, and media representation often has a big impact on how we view other people. So will our demonization of aliens in media impact how we act to our new acquaintances? Well, at least there's ALF and ET to balance things out, plus Star Trek has been showing us a future where humans and aliens coexist in the cosmos since the 1960s. So basically, first contact with aliens could work out. If humanity brings the best of the best to the negotiating table, the aliens come with our best interests in mind, religion and politics don't get in the way, and Hollywood behaves responsibly and sensibly, and above all, everyone needs to listen to the advice the scientists give us about a monumental moment in human history with plenty of risks and opportunities. Yeah, that should be fine. We can trust everyone to act reasonably. Send out the signal. Something doesn't feel right. It's as if you're being watched, but no one else is around. Stars fill the night sky, the wind gently blows, rustling the leaves on the trees around you. Then a bright light flashes on directly above you. The air seems to shimmer as an alien spacecraft decloaks. The beam of light encompasses you as your feet lift off the ground. As you look up, you're pulled toward the levitating flying saucer. You scream, but the force field around you refuses to let your cries for help escape. There are those among us who believe that there is no such thing as aliens, but to think that Earth is the only planet with life on it in a universe made of trillions of stars, each with several planets orbiting around them just like our solar system, is the epitome of human hubris. There are almost certainly other worlds with alien life on them. Perhaps these planets are inhabited only by microbes, or maybe there are advanced civilizations billions of light years away in an exotic galaxy we'll never know about. The point is that just because there are aliens out there doesn't necessarily mean they've visited Earth and probed its people. Then again, maybe we have been visited by curious aliens. In this case, how would an alien spaceship actually work? What technology would it need, and is it even possible to travel through vast distances of space in a reasonable amount of time? The craziest part of it all is that while you are watching this video, aliens could be watching you without you knowing it. The universe is around 13.7 billion years old. Earth formed about 4.5 billion years ago, and humans evolved less than a million years ago. This leaves a lot of time for alien civilizations to evolve and develop advanced technology to explore the cosmos. Any alien species that visits Earth has an understanding of the universe we can only dream of right now. The first thing you need to know about alien spaceships is that they can move extremely fast. If aliens live in our closest neighboring solar system, Alpha Centauri, it would take them just under four and a half years to reach Earth if they traveled at the speed of light. That seems doable, but the likelihood of intelligent life being that close is pretty small. Therefore, aliens must travel much further distances if they're visiting us here on Earth. It's possible that an alien spaceship could contain cryotubes that would put the crew asleep during a long journey across the cosmos. Even if their ship could travel at the speed of light, every single mission to Earth could take hundreds, thousands, or even millions of years, depending on where the home planet is. The cryotubes would put the aliens into a frozen stasis, so their bodies could not age and their cells would not degrade as they made the long flight to Earth. This could be done by subjecting the bodies to intensely cold temperatures, but the aliens would need to find a way to dethaw themselves and restart their life processes once it's time for them to wake up. Although the alien spacecraft might not actually need any type of cryosleep machinery at all, we don't know how long alien species live for. If the average life expectancy of an alien is a million years, then spending a few decades traveling to and from Earth isn't that big of a deal. Maybe the aliens have downloaded their consciousness into machines and they can live forever. Then it really wouldn't matter how long the journey took. Cryotubes are one technology that aliens probably need aboard their spacecraft, but a bigger problem is how do they get their ship from their homeworld to Earth? Like the early explorers on Earth, maybe the aliens would use sails to travel across the void of space. Solar sails or light sails are gigantic lightweight sheets made of aluminized mylar that use photons to move across the cosmos, like the sails of a ship use the wind to move across the ocean. Solar sails could use the photons released from stars, but these powerful generators can be few and far between. Instead, the alien homeworld could build a giant laser and shoot it directly toward Earth. 
The laser wouldn't be harmful to our planet as it would only consist of photons that would either pass right through us or be deflected by Earth's magnetic shield. But the alien spaceship could use its solar sails to ride the photon laser beam all the way to Earth. The beauty of spaceships that use light sails is that they will constantly accelerate once they're in the stream of photon particles. At first, the alien craft connected to the solar sail would be moving slowly, but as time went on, the constant acceleration would cause the speed to ramp up until the vessel was moving at close to the speed of light. This would allow the alien ship to travel across the galaxy while not having to use any energy for thrust. The energy saved could then be used for life support systems, the return trip, and to explore strange planets like Earth. For the sake of argument, let's hypothesize that aliens don't live forever and need to travel across the universe quickly so they can visit Earth and return home before the weekend ends. What technology could the alien spaceship need to be equipped with in order to allow them to traverse the cosmos in the blink of an eye? Alien astronomers and scientists have been exploring the cosmos for millions of years. They've developed sophisticated navigation devices that track down naturally occurring wormholes that connect two points in space-time. Maybe one wormhole connects the alien's region of space with our own, and they're using it as a bridge to come to Earth. The alien spacecraft would need to be equipped with special shielding or a force field that would allow them to safely pass through the wormhole without being crushed. They would also need a gravity-altering device to make sure the wormhole didn't collapse with them inside it. If these problems could be overcome, they would be able to travel across the universe almost instantaneously. However, wormholes are likely pretty rare in the universe, and a wormhole that connects an alien-specific region of space with ours seems highly improbable. Luckily, the alien spaceships are equipped with wormhole-creating particles. Us humans have no idea what these would look like or what they'd be made from, but theoretically, if there were particles that could tear a hole in the fabric of space-time, then travel between any two points might be possible. Wormhole opening technology seems highly unlikely even for an advanced alien spacecraft. However, warp drives might be much more suitable to the alien's needs. Rather than only traveling between two points in space, a warp drive would allow the alien ship to travel through space faster than the speed of light. However, you might remember from a different infographic show video that the laws of physics prevent anything from moving faster than the speed of light. So, how would this be possible? The alien ship would need to be equipped with a device that could warp the space around the vessel. This would create a warp bubble that would stretch and relax the space-time around the craft allowing the alien ship to move across space faster than the speed of light since it's not technically the object that's moving. The fabric of space-time would warp and unwarp over and over again, taking the ship with it. And since space-time doesn't have a speed limit, the aliens wouldn't be breaking the laws of physics as they zoomed around the universe. Humans have no idea how warp drive technology would work with our current technology and understanding of physics, but if aliens have visited us, it's likely this is their key mode of transportation. Regardless of what type of propulsion the alien spacecraft uses, there's one main problem they have to overcome before they can venture out into the universe. In order to make it to Earth, the alien spaceship would need to generate a massive amount of power. There are a few ways they might be able to do this. Everything from the engines and the computers to life support systems aboard the alien spacecraft needs to get their power from somewhere. Aliens have found ways to harness energy from exotic particles in space or generate cold fusion in the reactor cores to create massive amounts of power. Here on Earth, we're exploring ways to equip spacecraft with fusion nuclear generators and antimatter drives. If we assume that these are the best options for aliens to use as their power sources, their systems might look something like this. At the heart of the alien spacecraft, there is a nuclear power station. It would not look like a nuclear power station we have on Earth, but would be self-contained and easily able to fit into a single room. The amount of fuel needed to generate enough energy to move the spacecraft around the cosmos and keep all the systems running isn't a problem as these nuclear generators run off hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen is abundant in the universe as it's the main fuel source for stars and found in the atmospheres of almost every planet. The aliens would not need to store a lot of hydrogen because if they ever ran low, they could just swing by the nearest gas giant and refuel. The energy released from their fusion reaction of two hydrogen atoms fusing into helium is then used to power the entire ship. The best part is that the helium can then be repurposed for other uses or ejected back into space. Aliens might take a different approach than fission if they plan on traveling large distances that might not have any celestial bodies within them. The universe is composed mostly of empty space, and the distance between solar systems can be incredibly far. In these cases, the alien spaceship might use antimatter engines to generate the power they need. Scientists hypothesize that the amount of antimatter needed to power spacecraft from Earth to Mars is only a millionth of a gram. 
Therefore, a gram of antimatter could carry a vessel a million times the distance between Earth and Mars, or roughly 125 trillion miles. The energy for this type of engine would be created when antimatter and regular matter come into contact and annihilate. The best part about this type of reaction is that 100% of the mass of the antimatter is converted to energy when the reaction occurs. Nothing is lost, which makes it extremely efficient. The reactions are also 1,000 times more powerful than a nuclear fission reaction, meaning the engine would need to be secured within a very powerful containment field. The aliens likely overcame this problem long ago when they initially started exploring the solar system, but it might be wise to have a backup generator that runs off of fusion just to power the antimatter container field and make sure that it never fails. The aliens built a magnetic storage system that separates the antimatter from normal matter, so it doesn't annihilate prematurely vaporizing the alien spacecraft and everything in the surrounding area, including any planets such as Earth. This magnetic field moves the antimatter from its storage area into a feed system. It's here where the antimatter is held until the engines need to generate more power. Once it's ejected from the feed system, the antimatter and regular matter come into contact and immediately annihilate, causing an enormous burst of power. This energy will be used in the systems all over the ship. There will likely be excess energy created as well, which can then be siphoned into the magnetic rocket thrusters. When the blast is released into space, it will propel the alien spacecraft forward and could serve as an alternate mode of transportation to explore the surrounding area. So little antimatter is required to keep all the systems going and provide propulsion that this will likely be one of the main power sources aboard all alien spacecraft. Everyone knows the iconic shape of the flying saucer. Yet, there are very few man-made aircraft that look like this. Why do aliens prefer this shape, and how would it be possible for their spacecraft to move seamlessly in any direction? The answer is by using electrodes and the gases in a planet's atmosphere. The shape of a flying saucer works particularly well if aliens want to have the ability to move their vessels in any direction at a moment's notice. The hull is shaped in a way that creates very little air resistance or drag, but it's the electrodes placed all around the outside of the alien craft that gives it the ability to hover in place and then shoot off in any direction. The way the electrodes work is that they use an electrical charge to change the gases in the air into plasma. On average, our atmosphere's negative and positive particles are pretty much balanced. However, by heating up the air, the electrodes cause some particles to lose their electrons and gives them a positive charge. The alien spacecraft then uses its electrodes to generate an electrical current into the newly formed plasma, which then causes it to push against the neutral air around it. As the non-charged air pushes back on the ionized plasma, it also pushes on the alien spaceship in the opposite direction, propelling the craft in the desired direction. If the electrical current is equal on all sides of the spaceship, the flying saucer will just hover in place. Then all the aliens have to do is change the intensity of the electrical current on the opposite side of the ship from where they want to move, and it will be able to zip across the planet. Perhaps the flying saucer shape is not just used for aerodynamics but also because it allows for an even distribution of electrodes across the hull of the vessel. This form of propulsion does not require any fuel or thrust to move the alien craft. Therefore, it would be relatively silent as it flew around observing humans. The power to turn on the electrodes could come straight from the alien's antimatter engines, solar panels, or any other form of electricity-creating device. If we're honest with ourselves, then we know the aliens are pretty sneaky. If they weren't, then everyone around the world would have seen a UFO at this point. Therefore, the alien spacecraft must be equipped with some kind of cloaking device. The system might fail from time to time, which could explain why there are UFO sightings every now and then. However, cloaking would be an absolute necessity for any spacefaring aliens who want to observe local populations without being seen. The way alien cloaking devices could work is by bending the light around the spacecraft. In theory, the aliens could use special lenses that cause any light that comes into contact with a ship to bend so it's never reflected back at an observer. This would need to be done in such a way that the light is not absorbed by the lenses or reflected directly off them, but is bent so the light from behind the spacecraft still reaches the observer's eye. If they did use this form of cloaking, there would be a sort of ripple effect, like when you look at a straw going from the air into a glass of water. Although the straw doesn't actually break or shift, the change in medium causes the light reflected off the straw to bend differently. The same type of effect might occur with the alien cloaking device, causing it to distort the image your eyes should be seeing. You probably wouldn't be able to make out the exact shape of the spaceship that was using the cloaking device, but you would notice that there was something there if you looked hard enough. This is not 100% ideal for the aliens that want to remain hidden from humans, however there is another form of cloaking device that might solve all their problems. Rather than using lenses to bend light around a spaceship, the aliens might use thousands or millions of little cameras and screens to hide their vessel. On the hull of the ship, 
Tons of extremely high-definition screens project images of the background and landscape. When these screens are turned on, the camera on the back of the ship signals the screens in the front of the ship to project what they're seeing. This is done all around the alien spacecraft, making it completely invisible. The aliens would need super high-tech cameras, screens, and computers that could process millions of images at once, even while the spacecraft was moving. But since aliens are able to travel across vast distances of space to visit us, this shouldn't be too much of a problem. This brings us to the technology used to collect samples for their studies of Earth. Aliens didn't come all this way just to observe. At some point, they need to gather information and samples. Landing on the surface of Earth is too risky, as someone might accidentally stumble on their spacecraft. So the aliens use their tractor beam to pull cows, cars, and people into their vessels for further analysis. The tractor beams might use a couple of different methods to raise their specimens off the ground and bring them aboard. The use of high-powered magnets would be great for lifting metal objects like cars. These magnets can also be used to pull other aircraft toward the spaceship, where they could be stored safely in the alien docking bay. However, not all objects of interest are metallic. For example, a large magnet would never be able to pull a human off the ground and into a spacecraft. Therefore, one way aliens might get around this problem is by using incredibly loud speakers to create high-pressure vortexes that could pull things toward the ship. This would likely be extremely loud and painful for anyone caught in the beam, but it could work if the sound was concentrated around the object or person. A more viable option for a tractor beam might be to use what's called a solenoidal light beam. This would look sort of like a tornado of light that would wrap around an object and then slowly pull it toward the spacecraft. In tests here on Earth, the concept of using a helix of light to move objects seems to be viable, but only at the microscopic level. Therefore, the light beam would need to be pretty intense to lift a human off the ground and into the alien ship. There would be a delicate balancing act between bombarding the space around someone with high-energy particles without burning them to a crisp. Perhaps this is why scorch marks found on alien abduction victims and the planet's surface around where they are abducted seem not to be all that uncommon. An alien craft would also need to be able to defend itself. In space, there are countless objects that could cause hull breaches or wreak havoc on alien engines. On the planets the spaceship visits, there might be hostile entities that try to destroy their ship. Therefore, it's imperative that the alien ship has some kind of force field. The hull of the alien ship is made out of an immensely strong, lightweight material, but that might not be enough protection. The alien spacecraft could use electromagnetism to deflect incoming objects. In order for this to work, the object the spacecraft is trying to deflect must first be charged up so that when it comes into contact with the electromagnetic force field, it's repelled. The alien ship could do this by using an advanced tracking system and firing an ionized bolt of energy at the incoming projectile. This would charge up the particles around the outside of the object, and then the force field would be adjusted to match the opposite polarity of the now ionized object. The electromagnetic force between the two oppositely charged particles would repel each other and keep the ship safe. Another protective measure that alien crafts might be equipped with is a high-powered annihilation shield. The alien ship could have an outer hull and an inner hull that has an electric current flowing between the two. When an object either pushes the outer hull and inner hull together or penetrates them, it'll complete a circuit and the electricity flowing through both hulls will be dumped into the object. This will only work for metal objects and anything that can close a circuit, but the effects would be devastating. All of the electricity coursing around the ship will instantaneously enter the object, essentially vaporizing it. The problem with this shield is that it'll need time to charge up before it can be used again. Therefore, if multiple objects were to impact the ship one right after another, there might not be enough time to get the shield back online before the second impact. However, alien spacecraft have likely found a way around this problem by implementing multiple types of force fields on each vessel. As a last line of defense, an alien craft might need to fight back. At this point, they have done everything they can to observe in secret. But due to some unforeseen circumstances, humans have started to become hostile and their defensive measures have all failed. The alien ship is equipped with several sets of lasers and highly devastating weapons. They launch antimatter missiles first. Inside each one is a small core that annihilates on impact. The antimatter inside them powers the missiles, so they can travel for incredibly long distances. In fact, the alien spacecraft could be on the other side of the solar system when they launch the antimatter missiles. There would still be plenty of fuel to destroy pretty much any object once it reaches its target. When the missile impacts its target, the magnetic field holding the antimatter in stasis is deactivated. The antimatter comes into contact with regular matter and annihilates. This releases a huge amount of energy that consumes the target and destroys it instantly. The alien spacecraft also has lasers and particle beams that it can use with pinpoint accuracy. The particle beams are some of the most deadly weapons in the universe. These work by using a huge amount of energy to shoot hydrogen atoms along with free electrons and protons through a tube aimed at the intended target. When these high-energy particles impact another object, they transfer their energy to the atoms within it. 
This causes a cascading effect as more and more atoms become energized, eventually resulting in the target exploding. This could be done to anything that's made up of matter, which is everything in the known universe except energy. The scariest part about the alien particle beam is that it doesn't matter what size the object is, anything can be blown up with enough hits from the particle beam. Human soldiers would be instantly vaporized. Any aircraft trying to defend our planet would blow up in a fiery explosion. The planet itself could even be destroyed if billions of spaceships all bombarded the Earth with particle beams at once. That being said, we're still here, and it seems like if the alien ships have visited our planet, they've remained pretty well hidden. Therefore, it's more likely that any alien craft that has been to Earth has been here for exploratory purposes and not to conduct a planetary invasion. Perhaps in the future, aliens will reveal themselves to us and help us unlock the mysteries of the universe that allow them to build such wonderful spacecraft. Now watch first 72 hours after aliens make contact, hour by hour. Or check out Space Chief makes a shocking alien confession.